Hello. Let us know if you can hear me. Uh, just testing out audio. Yes, no. Can we hear you, Henrik? Is the audio working? Okay, so I'm coming through loud and clear. The music was coming through loud and clear. Thank you very much. We just need I can to get... hear you. Ah, I can hear Henrik. Here we go. Yay! We can hear people. I've got my um, wireless mic plugged into the USB. It's going to be a bit dorky, but it... Needs to charge. I didn't charge it okay, properly. It's messing I can't, I can't hear anything. Uh, we can hear. We can hear you, though. Mm -hmm. So just say anything. Like, tell us your PIN number for your bank account. No, don't do that. Um, beautiful. Okay, we have reached another Saturday. It's the early bird show, but we've got a big show today. We've probably got about an hour and a half worth of. Um, footage to get through with Ian Shepard. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. We pre-recorded, just so you guys know, we, we aren't doing Ian Shepard live because he's got children and families and stuff and he can't make it during our particular time. So Henrik actually recorded it earlier um, and uh, we'll just be playing you snippets of that during the show. Uh, there's about an hour and a half worth of footage uh, and some really, really good information. So hopefully um, the hard work that Henrik and Ian have put together, you guys will appreciate. Because I definitely, I've watched it all. I helped edit the, edit, edit the video. I can tell you that it's worth its weight in gold, definitely. There's a lot of really, really good bits of information to get out of this. Today, mastering's a, a pretty kind of cool subject, I think. Because what we're about to find out is it's not voodoo magic. Maybe we, maybe we think it is. Maybe it's not as hard as we think it is. I don't know. But I, I think, yeah, I think it's actually not, not as bad as we think it is. It's actually, I think it's something that we can all learn. Maybe we don't want to do it. That might be part of the problem. But I think it's something we can all learn. Fantastic. Um, we have uh, a video submission for Name That Synth from, um, da -da 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 -da, where did it go? And I have audio now. Ah, you've got audio, good. Um, name That Synth from Keith. So we've got to get that across to the other computer as well. And if you're wondering, I don't know if Keith's in yet. He will be though. I guarantee you he will be because that will come during the main show. Uh, I need to copy that across to the Mac. I thought I did. No, I don't want downloads. I want desktop. That'll be paste it there. All right, that's copied across. We'll get that queued up in a minute. Not worry about that. All right. Um, Henrik, how you been? You good? Um, actually not. I'm, I'm sick. I've been it for 10 days and oh, no. was just uh, saying I was getting back to work Monday, uh, yesterday. Um, but now I'm not sure and I've called uh, some people from work to, to warn them that I may not be ready yet. Right. So, but it, it's but besides not that. It's not what we. It's not the dreaded COVID, is it? It's something else. No, uh, it's. I, I think it's a sore throat, um, but it it has lasted for ten days, and I can't oh. sleep at nights. Um, Nasty. So, it's only in the afternoons and evenings I can sleep. Uh, else, I'm totally closed in the throat and nose. Uh, right. So, yeah. Um, well, I mean, if you if you want to jump off, mate, uh, if you're not feeling up to it, that's completely fine with us. Um, don't uh, push yourself, all right? No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Well, it's lovely to have you anyway. But I can't, um, I can't go to work and, and, and 
um, what do you call it, um, give it, pass it on to to everyone else. Yeah. That, that would yeah. be stupid. Yeah, so. contagious. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I mean, if it's something like laryngitis, it probably it probably would be. Um, but yeah, we're not doctors, though. We don't know these things. Right. Yes. Um, what have I been doing? Oh, okay. What I have been doing um, is last week we were playing around with the the FH2 um, module, which is the MIDI um, MIDI to CV converter by Expert Sleep, is the Factotum. And I was kind of running into some dramas where I thought maybe it was overriding the USB-C connection into the Mac and it was jumping off the MRCC connection, which is over in the corner there, which is my MIDI router. I actually found out that it was neither of those things. In fact, what it was, um, was the MRCC wasn't set up pr correctly. I'd forgotten to load the preset, uh, which was just me being, you know, pre-show brain. And the factotum needed a firmware update. And the firmware update is actually kind of tricky. So uh, it's one of those jobs where you've got to get a USB thumb drive and shove it into one of the USB ports and it loads a file. You've got to sort of do but hold down buttons and sequences and things like that to, to force it to go into firmware update. So I'm glad I didn't do that during the stream because that would have been <laughs> the most unriveting bit of uh, video footage ever. But the good news is I managed to update the firmware on it. And as a result now, I can, um, over here in the old Eurorack land, I can now sync Pamela's new workout to the FH2. Um, and we can probably even, you can probably even see that. You can see the two cables coming out of the FH2 there that I'm wiggling and they're going straight in. Now, the good thing about the factotum is actually, um, there's actually a cool feature on here. Let me just see if I can get Mac to work. We'll bring up that really ugly looking, um, whatchamacallit, uh, configurator tool that we we're all sort of whinging about last, last week how really, really ugly it is. Um, but we'll bring that up because I actually just wanted to show you guys something. So here's that configurator tool, which looked like an engineering project. Um, what you can do is you can upload from the FH2. So you can actually, it can pull down the settings. So we'll do that. And you can see that that's pulled down the settings. And um, if you actually go down to, where is it? There was a thing where it shows clocks. There we go. So if I enable show clocks there, notice that seven and eight here are already preset to be clock and run stop. Now, when you're into, in the world of CV, clock and run stop are actually really important because you can send a clock, which is basically um, like a trigger or a gate. And in that particular case, this is a 164T. Um, you can change that by the way. Um, and you can, it, it just keeps in time with your DAW. And the run stop is important because every time you press stop and play on your DAW, it will actually send a separate CV signal. And in PAMS, you actually do need those. So if I go across to PAMS and we use the illustrious remote control to maybe get PAMS into view. Let's see if I can zoom in on PAMS. I think it's probably the wrong angle um, to see, but I'll try, I'll try anyway. But um, we'll zoom up a little bit, go across. Sorry, this is very, very annoying for you guys. I know, but I should have thought about this before I started talking about it. Um, okay, so these two particular cables here, let's take that one out for a start so we can see what we're talking about. You can see clock and then underneath that one, it says run. So. If you go into the PAMS uh, user manual, the run is the run stop command. So that's very, very, very handy when you're running a DAW, and I'll show you in a sec why that's handy. PAMS is sitting there dormant at the moment. Let's go across back to the Mac and we'll launch Ableton. I've got to actually update Ableton. Uh, I've just got to message the beta there's a new beta that's just come out. Here we go. 
Now, if everything is set beautifully, let's check that everything is set beautifully, MIDI-wise. Is the, so the FH2 is actually been seen, beautiful. Now, if I click on play here, yes, it's working, okay, so. What I'm gonna do, I can't have, I can't show you two screens at once. Actually, maybe I can show you two screens at once. There we go. With the magic of DAW software, I press play and watch the PAMMs. Yay, she PAM starts and it's synced to the clock of the DAW. So um, I don't know if you can, you can't probably see that, but that little LED screen there actually says 120. And if I change this here on the DAW, I can change that to whatever I want, 133, and now it's saying 133 on the PAMs. Um, that is a beautiful thing for me. And I, you guys probably think, oh, whoop de do. MIDI has been able to do that for years. Yeah, but this is actually all CV. So um, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty happy with that. And the FH2 module does a really, really good job. Uh, it's pretty stable and it uses USB-C as, as I said before. So. That's going, that's going to be a cool thing for me anyway. Um, and what it does, because uh, I was actually thinking, Henrik, I was going to go and buy the Able, Ableton Link module. I was talking about it in Discord the other day. I don't really need to get it now because I can just sync straight from the DAW via USB. So that solves that problem. And then I can have the uh, Akai Force using Ableton Link. So I can have the DAW if I want as my master. I can change that around if I want to too. I can have it going the other way around. I can have Pamela's as my master if I want and it syncs everything else. So it really, it, you've got CV and you've got MIDI and they're all now kind of intertwined, which is a cool thing. Was it the FS8 or what was it? The model the you- FH2. The interface. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah FH2. Yeah. Um, does it go back to it? Is it that one? That one there. Yeah. I've been thinking about the, the big one, uh, but it's expensive. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. Expert sleeper stuff are pricey. Um, well, it's not all of them are, but most of their stuff that I've got has been... Um, I think most of it I've got second hand because I just can't afford to get them brand new. Usually second hand you can knock a few hundred bucks off. Um, luckily for me, I was able to get, um, I think I forget which one was second hand, but the, the other module I use is the ES8, um, which is the audio interface. So you've got a MIDI interface and you've got an audio interface. Now the ES8 uses light pipe as well as USB. So I can use it as a class compliant USB into the Akai Force or into the MPC Live or even into the PC, um, or I can use light pipe into the RME Diggy face. So that gives me flexibility. So I can have Eurorack going straight, straight in that way. Uh, and that's how I've been using, um, just so you know, that's how I've been using my Akai Force now for quite a while since that firmware update that came out recently. So it's been amazing because I've got multiple inputs now instead of just a stereo in and out um, to my Akai Force. And that means I can turn channels on and off and sample them and clip them. And um, I've got something like eight inputs, mono inputs from the module here. So it's beautiful. It's a thing of beauty and it sits right next yeah. to my mixer. It's uh, um, Yeah, I use uh, the NerdSec to interface with MIDI. And yeah, to to the computer door, uh, and then I I use the Bitbox Micro um, just to connect to the NerdSec. Okay. Uh, via MIDI. This is a bit of a spaghetti mess, but you can see the um, there's the Expert Sleepers module there. Um, I haven't got it connected at the moment. That's why you're seeing nothing plugged in. The USB port is one of those Type B square type connectors there. You've got the two light pipes in and out, and these are your these are your um, your inputs, and these are your outputs. Okay, so you get four ins, so you get two. You can have two stereo pairs coming in, which is perfect for me because the Mix BX, which is right next to it, has a stereo pair coming out of it. So, uh, and I've got another Mix BX that I'm going to integrate into my next 
you know, case that I set up. So the ES8 will be kind of the the final digital output of Eurorack that I'll that I'll have send somewhere, which is a cool thing. Um, yeah. Okay. I was I was considering be, be, between getting the Mordex data and and uh, the ES8. Um, yep. I decided for the Mordex data because. I, it was mostly because I want to, want to wanted to see the curves uh, of what I'm doing, uh, the voltages and such. Right. Um, and it's not always uh, that the computer is on while I I play with the modeler. So, mm -hmm. so I decided for for the data. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I would love to get the data as well just purely because it does a whole bunch of other stuff like the, it's got a cool little oscilloscope function in it uh, where you can actually look at four different um, four different data points on that which is actually a pretty cool thing. I've got an oscilloscope module which um, I haven't quite finished building yet. I've had it sitting as a project for months um, but the only thing that's wrong with that is it's actually it's um, it's kind of like it's a Plum Audio DIY project that he's grabbed like a, an eBay, um, one of those cheap sort of eBay oscilloscopes that you can get, $30, $30, $40 oscilloscopes from eBay and mangled it so that it works in Eurorack land. The, there's a few things that it can't do that the Mod, Mod X1 does, so the Data 1 does. And um, yeah, so I'm, the, the money side of the data is 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 the thing that stopped me. You, you probably would have spent a pretty penny getting yours, I guess. Yeah, but but I am a little disappointed that the software hasn't been updated since two thousand and seventeen. Yeah, it's been um, a while. Because there are a few things which should be improved, like quick toggling uh, things on and off. And you can't do that. You got to go into menus each time. Uh, mm. uh, and you have eight settings and an SD card, you could have 256 settings instead and a kind of quick toggling between those. But mm. it's not okay. it's not finished, I think. Um, it's okay for, for, for standard tasks, but, mm. but uh, it should be able to do more. Let's have a, let's have a chat. Like, to the chatties because they've been bustling away in the background and uh, I haven't even set it up. Look at that. It's all grey. What have I done? I've forgotten to copy the link. Just give me a sec. It only takes a couple of seconds. Pop out chat, copy link, close that. Sorry, guys. Um, setting up shows. There's so many things I've got to remember. And if only I could have a good brain and remember everything. Rand, you should have a checklist. Yes, I should. Here we go. Hello, chatties. Nice of you all to join us. Um, we'll put ourselves up in the corner there while, while we're chatting to you. Hey, that's looking nice and neat. Look at that, beautiful. Um, what we'll do is we'll say we'll say a, a very early hello to everyone. Starting off with, um, well, Darren's probably just going to be on a bit later, but Darren was first. I think um, well, Eddie will get the yellow jacket because he's not a, on the video side of things today. So... Eddie, who's F Rose in chat. Hello to you. Martin Taylor's next. Um, who was next after that? Bert, ASIO Head. Good to see you, mate. Um, Manny's there, Dr. Synth. Um, this is Renz. Nice to see you guys. Um, who else we got? Nuri. Hello, everyone, he says, or she says. I don't know who Nuri is, so big uh, hello to you. Wagoo's there. Uh, Future World Machines. And I'm scrolling. If you're wondering what I'm doing. You can't actually see me scrolling because it's a different screen. Um, Dark Joint is there. I had one of those ones. Uh, it didn't work out well. Um, Dumb Jez is there. I'm here all night, by the way. Cresshead's there. Hello, Cresshead. Um, and Robbie Puricelli, failed muso. Arvo, he says. Big hello to you, mate. Nice to have you. And uh, who else we got? Hmm. Most of most of them have covered. Usually when I do this, everyone sort of jumps in. Rustic Ink is here. You can load a Rustic Ink. Haven't seen you for a while, actually, unless you've been lurking. 
Um, you probably you probably say, I was here yes last week. What are you talking about? Daniela's there. Hello, Daniela. Uh, checked out one of your videos during the week. It was pretty cool. Bit of a um, a movie sort of um, uh, sort of audio dub thing. It was actually pretty cool, like a sci-fi thing. Um, nice, nice stuff. Nice stuff. Human error is there. Hello, human error. Nice to see you. And uh, that's it so far. Pretty cool. Nice. This is the early bird show, so we can't expect everyone to be here. Okay. Right. So, uh, Henrik, I think we should get into um, what have we got? We've got about forty-five minutes, so. Um, we're looking at the length of some of these sections that we've got in this video is to come up. Um, let's see. Can you remember how long they go for? Um, I can't. Well, I can talk about something else. Um, yesterday I saw a video from Inverted Popes um, yeah. where he play, played with Bidwick. And um, yes, I must say, I'm falling for Bitwick. I haven't tried it yet, but oh yeah, you get Bitwick. It looks, yep, it looks very good. Yeah, look, um, I I'm, I'm a bit tired of yeah. I've got Bitwig and I've had it for a while. I've been talking about it. Um, you 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 probably know that um, Bitwig is kind of a stem from Ableton because some of the employees that develop Bitwig used to work for Ableton. So it's got if you, if you're looking at a DAW that's probably got its closest ties to Ableton, that would be the one. Um, the other cool thing about Bitwig is if you're into modular, which like you and I both are, it has um, some really inherent built-in features that a lot of the others don't by default. I mean, I mean, Ableton does have Max for Live and you can do this sort of stuff in Max for Live, but it's not built-in inherently, so you've got to go and mm. muck around with third-party or muck around programming. That sort of CV I've, sort I've, of I've, stuff. I've, 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 about Max for Live, uh, is it Max in Bitwig or do they have their own uh, scripting language? Language or what? That's a good question. I don't know. It's probably one for the chatties to answer. I actually haven't got that far. Yeah. The only reason we should be doing, I think we, we should get IP on, on he hasn't been on for a while, and we should do a Bitwig show because I'm of the same opinion. I, I mean, I'm not going to drop Ableton because I've used it since the early 2000s. Um, and, and it's just something that I'm used to using. But um, I do like some of the cool things that Bitwig are doing. And the other thing, too, that I like about Bitwig, um, me being a computer geek, is that it runs on Linux. So you can um, you can say goodbye to commercial software forever if you want and go down the Linux route um, if you want to. Uh, I don't know if that would purely work for me, but um, it would work for some people. I know some guys who are, are Linux musicians and they are doing some wonderful things, especially some of the Eurac people. There's Eurac purist people out there who who are against commercial software. They they love open source. Um, obviously, Bitwig not, isn't, isn't, is a commercial piece of software, but um, it is a pretty good thing for them in that world because it's, uh, um, it's you know, a decent DAW for that platform anyway. Um, yeah, so do you get it? Let's get on to the mastering stuff. Do you want to, um, should we start off? We've got the video all lined up now. Let's, let's, in, let's introduce, um, okay. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to play sort of snips from about an hour and a half worth of interview, um, that, um, Henrik did with Ian Shepard, and he did this a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the reason why Ian's not on the show is, the reason why we did this is actually because Ian can't make this particular time slot because he's got a family and it's his Saturday and it's his time off. Um, but what we've done is we've edited the video, we've sliced it up into different sections. And um, what we'll do for you guys is we'll play the video segments um, and we'll pause, we'll have a chat about what we just talked about, and then we'll go on to the next. And in about 40, 35 minutes or so, no, 40, what am I saying, 50 minutes or so, we'll start the main show and we'll go through our standard segments and we'll, we'll get through that, and then we'll come back and keep going with the mastering stuff. So that's, that's pretty much going to be taking up most of the show today. Um, Henrik, I'm gonna 
hand it to you. Do you want to just, um, let's set it up with a quick intro and then I'll, uh, when you're ready, I'll hit play on the video and we'll go straight into it. Um, tell us a little bit about how this started and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get it set up from there. Yeah, um, I've, I've, uh, I've listened to a podcast called The Mastering Show um, by Ian Shepard, Shepard and another guy, I can't remember his name, but it's mentioned later. Um, and uh, I, I, I learned a lot and I got uh, very confused too, um, but finally found out uh, what it was all about, how simple it actually is. Um, not that I make good masters yet, but but I know how to master now. Um, I only have to get better monitors and such to to make it complete. Um, but but um, the mastering show taught me all that, and um, Ian um, is a mastering engineer who's been in the business for centuries, no, not centuries, uh, decades. Um, and uh, he has mastered bands like like um, Spandau Ballet uh, and um, Culture Club and mm -hmm. and lots of other bands. And, Play West. Uh, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a, a big guy in the business and uh, um, he has also fought a war called the Loudness War uh, together with, with another engineer called Bob Katz, who's uh, very famous. Um, and um, some of the interview will be about that too. Um, so so let's, let's start with part one. Yeah, and part one is, um, let me just get this ready. Part one is a little introduction. Um, so Ian just uh, talks about himself a bit. So this will just kind of flow onto what uh, Henrik just said. By the way, I should, we should drop names because he also worked for the um, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. He did stuff for Deep Purple. So dropping names is good. He's probably not the sort of person that will drop names, but we'll drop them for him. <laughs> and if you're, um, if you're watching Ian, um, thanks very much for, for doing this for us. Um, there's going to be a good uh, 500 to 1,000 people that will definitely enjoy um, what you're about to, uh, to give us. So without further ado, let's do it. We're not getting audio, are we? No, not yet. Okay. Just let me see if I can sort the audio out. Just one sec, guys. I can't remember it all, so I c couldn't do the lip sync. <laughs> <laughs> all right, just give me a sec. I've got audio here. Hello, Ian. Okay. Today we're talking mastering, and let's hear a little about yourself. Okay, sure. Um, so I've been professional mastering engineer for 25 years now hardly seems possible i came into it in an i think an unusual way lots of mastering engineers have already been recording engineers or producers before they get into mastering but i had just qualified from my degree course and had been working uh, for free in a studio near where my parents lived and had written letters to here in the uk at that time we had uh, there was a big directory of studios and audiovisual <clears throat> facilities and I had sent letters out to I don't know 20 or 50 different places in in parts of the country that I thought it might be nice to live and I got a call from uh, SRT sound recording technology which is a leading independent mastering facility here in the UK um, I didn't even know what mastering was at that point but it was a job in the music business so I, I said yes and it turned out that uh, I was perfectly suited to mastering I you know, when I was really young, I was taking cassette tapes to pieces and rebuilding them to try and get better high frequency response and always tweaking my speaker setup and, you know, uh, worrying about end of side distortion on vinyl, all those kind of things. So, uh, yeah, they, they 
you know, I was I was trained, I was mentored, which uh, I feel really lucky about. You know, that's that's quite rare these days. And yeah, I, I worked there for 15 years before I left to set up my own company. You do, uh, you have fought a war, um, the loudness war. <laughs> Can you fighting. tell about it? Yeah, fighting, yeah, still. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the loudness war has been going on forever. Um, you know, I think we're in the second or third loudness war at this point. You know, there was a loudness war on vinyl, there was a loudness war on CD, and now there's a loudness war on streaming. And it's it's basically driven by this misconception. You know, this it's a fact that if you play somebody two pieces of audio, which are otherwise identical, and you turn one of them up ever so slightly, people will hear a difference. And most people will think that the slightly louder one sounds slightly better. It's based on something called the equal loudness curve or the Fletcher Munson curve or the smile curve, which um, basically means that the more you turn things up, the more our ears or our brains think that there is more treble and bass in the sound. So louder sounds tend to sound bigger and wider and brighter and have more space and depth and all the rest of it. So that's fine. Um, but what it means is that there is a natural tendency for people to want the things that they work on to be slightly louder or a lot louder than everybody else. And again, that's fine, except that at some point you run out of headroom. So, you know, on if you're cutting vinyl, you're going to burn out the cutter head. Um, yeah. If you're uh, recording to analog cassette, you're going to saturate the cassette. And with CDs and other digital formats, um, you know, file formats that we use these days, you have zero dB FS, this maximum limit that uh, the signal can't go beyond without clipping. Now, you can keep pushing the loudness up closer and closer to that point. But in order to do that, you have to use you have to control the dynamics somehow. So to stop the music kind of jumping up over the top and dis distorting, you have to use compression and limiting. And so the loudness war is this kind of race of people trying to get louder than everybody else. And the, the problem with it is that it can actually harm the music, in my opinion. The, you know, there's you definitely need to be loud enough. Uh, if, if something is too dynamic, it can be almost as much of a bigger of a problem. You, it can, uh, the verses and choruses can, there can be too much difference. Um, it may not sound full or dense or um, thick enough or aggressive enough or intense enough, if that's what you're going for in terms of the sound. Um, but once you get past a certain point, it stops sounding better and it just starts sounding worse. It can feel held in and kind of claustrophobic and... Um, dull and lifeless and, and if you go too far it can actually end up being distorted so there, there's, there's a sweet spot that, that is the ideal place to be yeah I, I i guess that's why people are liking vinyl more today because it's it's not over compressed as it was on on cds well it's vinyl is complicated because lots of vinyl is still over compressed um, because the something that lots of people don't realize is that lots of vinyl is actually cut from the same digital file that was used for all the other masters. Um, the difference is that, as I say, you can, simply can't cut vinyl super hot because you'll burn out the, the cutting head on the lathe um, and they cost a fortune, so no vinyl cutting engineer is going to want to do that. Um, so there's not really any point in making it super loud beforehand because it's going to get turned down. So what you sometimes find is that people decide to take advantage of that and kind of say, OK, well, because it's going to be for vinyl, I'm going to actually ease back a bit and make use of the, the available headroom. And so in those cases, you can end up with vinyl releases that are more dynamic and sound better than the digital versions. But that's it's not all of them by any means. It's, it's a certain proportion. And I mean, there are other things that people like about the vinyl sound as well, you know, that all contribute and you get those things as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, I, I mean, my advice in general to people is to always master as though it was going to vinyl. In my opinion, you know, I mentioned that the sweet spot, if you imagine it's going to vinyl and optimize it in that way, it will sound fantastic on all of it sound fantastic on vinyl and on digital and on streaming and on cassette and anywhere else you want to to put it so 
And it's interesting that, that you know, that the technical limitations of the vinyl format actually correlate really closely with so many of our favorite albums, you know, from back in the, in the day when things were cut from uh, to vinyl. You listen to those and think, well, they sound fantastic. And it, it just fits perfectly into that sweet spot. And it, it's still true, but the majority of releases these days are pushed much harder than that. Okay, so we are up to part three, which um, we're going to go check out in a sec. Um, but before we do, I thought that was a good time to pause because we're talking about the old sausage war, isn't it? The loudness war. And uh, you guys might remember we did this meme a couple of years ago on the show. Um, saw them from somewhere else, of course, probably Facebook. But um, that's what we're talking about. So dynamic range and the way um, compression is overused in the industry. Um, he, Ian will go into some more uh, information about this. So don't worry, we, um, we're not just getting that and that's it. He's actually going to talk about RMS and LUFs and uh, streaming um, sides of it. So we'll get into that a bit later. Um, but what I thought we'd do while we've got that particular topic up is just have a quick chat to the chatties. Um, what do you guys think about what Ian just said in regards to the loudness war? Let's see what the chatties think. Henrik, have you got a comment you want to make while we're waiting for the chatties? 10 second delay or whatever it is? Mm, no, no. Um, I was also about to read what they wrote <laughs> and then, <laughs> when, when the section was over. Um, so I'm reading now. Yeah. Um, just, to, just to let you guys know too, the, the video was actually recorded uh, with Zoom. Is that right, Henrik? It was done on a Zoom a Zoom call? No, no. Um, it was I can't remember. Uh, stream, I have no account. For, for, streamyard. Yeah, streamyard. Streamyard. Um, and it was on, on Ian's uh, Streamyard. I have no yeah. Streamyard account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the one of the negatives of that is the uh, resolution was only seven twenty. Uh, I actually stream out at ten eighty, but that particular video was. It will actually be 1080 when you guys see it, but it will be a little bit pixely. There's nothing much I can do about it. But the audio is the most important thing, not the video. Um, it's just one of the things. Yes. Um, what, what I guess is kind of important about this kind of loudness war is when we listen to, let's say our favorite, one of our favorite records, like ones that you've listened to over and over again, and you think, God, the mixing on that is beautiful. And, and it's just, it sounds good on everything I played on. It sounds good on my headphones. It sounds good in the car. It sounds good on the stereo, on the hi-fi. That that one is kind of a really good one for you guys to, um, to to look at. I don't know if you can somehow get a copy of that and load that into some sort of audio waveform software like um, Ian talks about what he uses in a minute, but uh, you could look at something like maybe um, uh, SoundForge or uh, if you've got an Adobe um, subscription, you could look at Aud is it Audacity, I think it's called. Those sort of things which gives you those, those uh, visualizations of those um, you know, waveforms and look at one of your tracks and compare it to one of your favorites and just see, just, just as a real basic sausage comparison, <laughs> that's a bad, bad word, but just as a, like we looked at that, that even though that was a bit of a, a joke graphic before, we did look at that but compare yours to one of your favorite albums or your favorite tracks and just see, you know, that would probably be a really good insight as to where you're at, just as a basic level. What do you think about that as an idea, Henrik? Yeah, um, but you don't even need Audacity or WaveLab or whatever you use. Um, you can just import it into your door and, and look at the track there. Um, and, yeah. and uh, import your um, um, reference tracks there too. Um, and then you're already a long way, so you can mix it right because you have it mm. right there. Mm. Uh, mix, I mean, master. So it's good to get, it's good to get people's ideas thinking now about, about the loudness war because that's kind of part of it. But um, what we should probably do is is go to the next segment where Ian actually talks about his mastering show. 
But at the end of the day, he's he's given us all, uh, his time. Um, it's it's a really good idea that we um, share some love and promote what he's doing. And um, you guys, if you've never ever heard of this, um, we'll check out the YouTube channel in a sec. But let's have a listen to what Ian's doing over on his mastering show. And if I can get my mouse to work, which I can never seem to do. And I think it's this button here. And today, and for some years, you have been doing a show on on podcast uh, streaming services and on YouTube. Um, still, only the mostly only the audio. Um, tell a little about about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's called the Mastering Show, and it's it's a show where we talk about anything and everything related to mastering and some other stuff that I think is interesting as well. So um, we've been going three or four years now, uh, almost up to our 80th episode, and people really seem to like it. Um, my co-host is John Tidy, uh, who runs reaperblog.net and also used to be co-host of the Home Recording Show. So he has uh, you know great experience in, in podcasts. and. Every week we try and pick a topic or have a guest and, you know, really dive into the kind of topics that we're talking about here, you know, about loudness and, you know, how to, what to do in mastering, what not to do in mastering, you know, what is mastering, um, you know, uh, anything that we think people would be interested in, basically. And yeah, it's it's been really successful. I've actually, I've had some people write to me saying that they love the show and they're They've kind of listened all the way through to it two or three times, which <laughs> I find hard to believe. I, I get tired of listening to my own voice, let alone somebody else having to listen to it all the time. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's great that people have, have responded so well to it. I've, I've only heard them once. Um, and I must say that there are many episodes. Um, uh, what are you on? Uh, above 100? No, I think I think uh, this is I think the last one we recorded, the one we just released, is number seventy nine. So we're coming oh. up for the eightieth episode. So <laughs> yeah. it'll be on a hundred soon. Yeah, I must say I I I, I learned a lot uh, in 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 that show. I also got a got a bit confused, um, <laughs> but 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 I am. Um, in the end, I, I really learned a lot also about the confusion and and why I shouldn't be confused. Um, but yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting because um, one of my favorite sayings is that mastering is simple, but that that doesn't mean that it's easy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we can talk a bit about what mastering actually is, but, you know, at its essence, it's, it's very straightforward. It's just about balancing the EQ and the dynamics of all the pieces of music um, to fit together into a pleasing, you know, uh, collection, whether that be a single or a playlist or an album. But when you, you know, it's music, right? So there are technical issues and there are, but a lot of it is, is it's art, it's taste, it's subjective. So there's, a, there's some really interesting gray areas in the middle of it. And a lot of mastering in particular, a lot of it is quite technical, you know, in, in recording and mixing up to a point, if it sounds good, it is good, regardless of what it was, it was that you did to, you know, I think Sylvia Massey, you know, runs audio signals through potatoes and other pieces of fruit or, you know, records things in a, an abandoned aircraft hangar just because it sounds interesting or records the sound of a guitar being towed along a road behind a truck, you know. All of those are things that you might say are wrong, but they're not wrong because they end up getting a creative result that she likes. That also applies in mastering, but to a much lesser extent. My goal when I'm mastering is to be invisible. You know, that my simple definition of mastering is to make it the music sound the best that it can be. But that involves having empathy for what the artist and the engineers were trying to achieve and not I'm not trying to stamp my own sound on something I don't want to listen somebody to listen to it and go oh wow listen to the the mastering compression that Ian used on that you know I just want them to listen to it and say oh, I love this piece of music it, you know it makes me want to dance or cry or laugh or sing and, and not be thinking about the technical aspects at all so I want my part to be invisible and that means you have to have a pretty deep understanding of 
the music you know the what they were trying to achieve and how to get there but also all of the technical stuff that enables you to do that so keeping invisible is that why you made the dynamic range day no dynamic range day is very much about being visible <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so dynamic range day is is it's a, an online event designed to make a noise about the loudness war you know i wanted to help raise awareness of the issue so it started off the original idea was just that everybody would type in capital letters all day which you know is is known as shouting on the internet um and that was meant to be uh, you know it's kind of a joke about because the, the, the whole thing about loudness is that you can't have something something can't sound loud unless it's got something quiet to contrast with um so when you type in capital letters all the time you know it reads in a very shouty kind of way and the same is true of music if you just slam the loudness the whole time th there's no light and shade there's no variety anyway so that was a fun idea for the first dynamic range day um, and people enjoyed it but the people doing it enjoyed it much more than the people watching it um who just found it annoying so we changed it from from then on uh and it's you know it's kind of evolved over the years but every year we i give away an award to an album from the previous 12 months um that has had great dynamics and ideally is kind of popular accessible mainstream because i have no problem with people making music super loud if that's what they want to do my concern is that so many people feel that they have to make their music loud in order to sell records or to compete or um you know to 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 sound right um and that's the bit that, that concerns me is when people make you know the the last miley cyrus album was a kind of pop folk thing and was a minus four lufs we could talk about lufs <laughs> um that's 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 as loud as a metallica album right and it's miley cyrus singing pop folk um it makes no sense to me that artistically and i mean m maybe that was her artistic vision but I, I i bet that wasn't the case so dynamic range day is about saying look here are all these albums that have been super successful sound fantastic um and weren't ridiculously loud um and just m making people aware of the the issues and, and having a bit of fun at the same time. Hello and welcome to the Production Advice website. My name. Sorry, you guys couldn't hear me. Okay, um, now we can. Okay, so we're just having a look at the Production Advice YouTube channel, which is what um, Ian Shepherd runs, and uh, I'll link that in um, actually into the chat room. Um, it will be linked on the uh, show notes as well. I've typed it correctly. Advice. I think I've typed it correctly. Anyway, um, you can see he's uh, doing pretty good. He's got 35,000 subscribers and he runs a weekly, um, I guess it's weekly, isn't it? Podcast. I don't know if the podcast is on here. I, I will grab the podcast in a sec. But anyway, that's, um, that's how you can find Ian. Um, and he also talked about the... Um, that, uh, what was that thing called again that he was just talking about? I've forgotten the name of it. Henrik, come on, you were doing the interview. Um, oh, that was, um, ah, what was it called? A special day. Um, uh, Hang on, I'll get it. I forgot. Wait, wait, um, wait, 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 wait. I don't have the interview notes right here. Perhaps I should find them. 
Oh, I've only got the uh, the other thing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, the podcast is what we wanted to get. Sorry, let me just grab the podcast. It the thing was where it, dynamic range day. Dynamic range day, that's it. The thing where he shouts. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. Let's just let's just get this link up as well. This is the podcast. Um, it is called The Mastering Show. And this is just an audio, isn't it? Yeah, this is just an audio thing. So um, he's, yeah, up to 79 episodes. Last one he did was the 20th of November. So he's due for another one, I guess. Um, that link yeah. was... That's also in the chat now as well. Okay, cool. So we've covered those. So, so it's, people... it's, it's also on other podcast services. Um, I just used Castbox. And Is it on? That's um, why you've got them. on Spotify. I have. I don't know. I haven't checked there. Um, okay. Probably. All right. Groovy, groovy. Um, now the next thing is that um, he he does actually have a bit of a synth. Um, a cool a cool story actually I, I'd say to do with synths and I think we should share it with you guys. Um, I think you go, you guys would all enjoy this anyway. So let's have a listen to Ian's little synth story. When I was at college, um, I did physics and music. Mm -hmm. um, and it was literally a physics degree and a music degree running side by side. So I part of the time would be quantum mechanics and part of the time would be Bach chorales and Schenkerian analysis and stuff. But there was a crossover in the middle, which was the acoustics course. Um, and the thing that I thought you might be interested to know is that um, our uh, the lecturer, the guy who ran the course, um had been teaching since i guess maybe not the 60s but maybe the 70s um and uh, in the studio um they had a synthy 1000 um mm. which is you know like a vcs3 the size of a wall um yeah. and uh part of our we were set exercises where it was kind of you know simple synthesis of you know creating these kind of things and create you know, certain envelope shapes and all the rest of it. Um, I have to say it was incredibly labor intensive for some sounds that really weren't worth it at the end of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was an amazing machine. Um, it had candlesticks on it. That's how big it was. <laughs> <laughs> Our viewers uh, are mostly sent geeks and many of So that's that's why I'm I'm vaping there. I was trying not to vape while doing the interview. <laughs> so, Sorry, I I, um, I keep turning my mic yeah. off and I keep talking without remembering to turn it back on. I should be taking so many drinks; it's not funny. Um, yeah, I, I heard you say that, but it's um doesn't matter. It's no it's not a problem. Not a problem. Um, we're going to leave that part till after we do the main show because we're actually heading up to the main show now and. Uh, and as we always do, we always like to say hello to Brooksy, who's uh, turned up. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Andy. Hello. Is this working? Is the mic it is. Working and stuff? is yeah. it yes. Oh, bloody hell. Wonders never cease. There we yeah. Are. What's going on? Uh, <laughs> Henrik, you all right? What's going on? Not a lot. You know, Hi, Andy. I, I'm, I'm here. They've not put me in a box and nailed down the lid yet, which is always good. So, <laughs> so. I think you'll find Darren will probably pop up above you in a sec. Because I, right. I have seen him today. Uh, now, now does, does that mean you need? Do you need an, uh, an extra slot? This this chap who's coming along. What's his name? I've forgotten his name. No, no, he he's um, he's on a on a replay record. We've we've already got his. Oh. Yep. He won't be he oh, won't be joining right. us. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. I'm with you. Just to, just to reiterate, because I've mentioned it before, but just for Andy and anyone who's joined us, um, we're playing a recording that um, Henrik, who's below, <laughs> Jake's 3D, he did with uh, Ian Shepard um, about a week ago, and um, we've been just editing it into the sections. And um, uh -huh. the, the yeah. reason why we're doing it this way is because uh, Ian couldn't actually make it to the time slot that our show's on. 
Um, but in, in a sense, this is actually probably better because um, he gets to say what he needs to say um, and, you know, he can spend time with his kids and any questions, I guess, that we, we've got, um, I'm sure he'll jump into the, you know, the channel comment section and, and answer away. So, yeah, I've linked all the YouTube channels and podcasts so far for him. Um, yeah. And uh, Darren will be here in a second. Um, the only thing I haven't done yet is I haven't actually put any pictures in for our scamming section. So I'll do that um, whilst I'm talking to you guys. We've got about 10-ish minutes. So I don't know, it's a bit more, 18 minutes to go before the main show. We could probably, we could probably show a bit of this, couldn't we? Uh, Henrik, we probably show a bit of this. It's a big section, this one coming up. How long does this bit go for? So this is um, part, part part six. Goes for a fair while on part six. I'm just trying to find where it starts and where it finishes. And we can just do a short chat here. Um, what yeah. have Andy been up to? N not being ill. That's what I've been up to, just being ill oh, and rubbish too. and not yeah. very good at anything. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got absolutely nothing interesting to say at all, Henrik. But <laughs> 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 done nothing, <laughs> seen nothing. You guys are the nothing. life of a party, aren't you? Hey, both sickies. But isn't that, isn't oh, that interesting that he has nothing is interesting to say? <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Well, rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, I will jo I will <laughs> join you guys on the sickness side of things, but my sickness is not of the you know sniffy nose or sore throat. I actually tweaked my hip, and I, I must have bent funny and bent over, and I felt something go pop, and spent mm. the last couple of days in agony and anti-inflammatory rubbing creams and stuff like that on me to try and sort of calm it down. It's been a little bit better today. I was actually man I managed to get out on the bike, and um, they they always say if you have little injuries like that, the best thing to do is, is so as soon as you can get mobile again to try and exercise it back out, because um, it usually it speeds yes, up the but, healing. But you just turned fifty, right? <laughs> yes. Don't don't say that too often, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm in oh. the middle of the fifties. Just getting out of bed hurts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, life, life has niggles when you get to our northern ages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sound like a bunch of old crankies, don't we? Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, okay. So um, you guys keep talking, and I'll and I'll jump in. I've got the scam photos I need to, to load in, so you guys can have a little chat amongst yourselves. Um, and hopefully, Darren turns up as well. <laughs> it's always touch and go with that. Uh, he'll be here. I think he's put something up on Bandcamp. I'm sure he you've has. seen that. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, we'll show that so a bit that's later. That's always cool. We'll definitely show that. I didn't that get up. that far. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll talk about that in a minute or two. But Keep going. You're doing well. Oh, oh, oh right. Um, keep going. Right. Well, I uh, I did back Any modules? With the computer. Uh, no, nothing, nothing new yet. Um, uh, all, all of my spare cash has now been taken up by two major irritations. The first one is a bus lane infringement. If that means anything to you, it means I went in a bus lane when I shouldn't have done, got caught on a camera. Now I've got a big fine to pay. Well, sixty quid, which is irritating, and uh, a speeding ticket for doing thirty-seven miles an hour. What? Uh, I'm just like, how the hell does that happen? Well, so uh, that's going to cost me a hundred quid to go on the, the speeding was that, course. Was that in the twenty-five or something? Was that thirty? Thirty, okay. Thirty zone. You know, it'll be one of those bits. Of, there's some roads out around the edges of Sheffield, which where the speed limit changes all the time. Where you know, you, it's it's forty, then it's fifty, then it's thirty, and you're like, what? I must have. I just missed it. I'm annoyed at myself because I know those roads really well, and there'll have been a little guy standing in a tree with a camera or sitting in a tree with a camera you know so i've, I've got you know i've got to cough up those which and oh, you, anyway it's just are you angry about life irritations are you angry about how your government is raising revenue for itself is that what you're angry about <laughs> the whole conspiracy I just, theory. you know well uh, i no i just, uh, 
when I when I sent the uh, the thing back to well, it's South Yorkshire Police. I, I sent it back to South Yorkshire Police, and I just said, "Are you running short of funds? Is that why you're doing this?" And just <laughs> said, "Yes, I'm, yes, I'm guilty." Yeah. Uh, I, was, I know they do that. I mean, a, 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 someone who I used to know years ago who worked for the police was a police officer. Did say they get told there's twenty tickets. Get out. Get out and don't come back until you've got rid of them. I don't know if they still do that sort of thing now. It's all gone very digital, but they used to. Don't come back until you've got rid of those 20 speeding tickets. What? It's <laughs> just cynical. That's they did, honestly. Well, anyway, but that's... Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit disgruntled, so... Oh, it's just what life's irritations, isn't it? I don't think it's any different where where anyone lives. I, I mean, unless you're, you're lucky and you live in some sort of society that actually runs ethically. But I think we all, we, we all know that some of the... The policing fines are definitely ways that they can give themselves pay rises or buy themselves new cars or whatever it is that they get, um, or yachts. I'm not sure. Um, Darren, you've turned up. Hello. Hello. How are you? Uh, can you uh, can you hear me? I can. Have you? Yeah. Are you? Um, are you merching up for some reason today? I know what it is. By I'm the way, merching up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's have a look at him. He's merched up. I'm merching. It's merched up, but you see. You... Oh, I mean, look at how much merch can you get? Yeah. Steak knives as What's well. What's that name, Sissy? Damn, I knew. I knew. Steak knives. Steak I knives. I did the forks, but not the knives. <laughs> it's a pizza chain, isn't it? No, you did, the, you did the stems, but not the steak knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we're we're sick of looking at Darren now. Um, Darren, we definitely are going to give you go. You're a bit of a spot to um, talk about your thing. Um, I've been listening to your uh, master and think it's good. <laughs> yeah, Henrik's done a good job. He's a good man. Thanks. Um, not always, though. <laughs> <laughs> I bet mean, he's not so well today. Oh, so I, I, like, I like to hear that. <laughs> All right. Um, But but that title behind you, Darren, uh, Sissy, what, what is that? Sissy. Uh, no, that's not, ah, no, that's not what no. you think it is. <laughs> that is not what you think it is. All right. Shall we, shall we just do this, Darren? We'll just do this. And you, and you can talk us through it. All right. Here we go. Yours, your Bandcamp page. Tell us yes, a little bit about it. It's 20, it's 2121. That's been, you've all been, well, I presume you've all been waiting for it. I've been giving, Holy been giving out little, uh, little, there's 17 tracks there, over 110 minutes long, uh, all together. Um, and yeah, if anyone worked out the track that I put out last week with all the numbers, now in the UK, we put the day before the month, usually. Uh, everyone else puts the month and the day. So if you worked out the numbers on the last track from last week, you will find that it's the 21, 21. It's the 11th of the 12, 21. And it was launched at 11, 11 a.m. Uh, and there's a few other connotations in there. Uh, the 22, 22 that's actually on the track of last week will be the track for the 22, 22 album or one of the tracks. So, yeah, there's quite a lot going on. And if you look at sort of like any of the tracks, there's, it's all sort of space orientated and there's meanings to it. So it tells you what each of those track names is or meant uh, as like bedding one, for instance, what bedding one is um, and so on. Uh, yeah, 17 tracks, all free. Go and download it and put it on your finger. You've got over 110 minutes of listening. So mm. it's lots of electronic trans techno. It's just DTH, basically. You know what my style is. So it's basically well, all that. Uh, let's let's play one. Um, there is there's a few spelling mistakes in there. Just well, just one anyway that I is can that? find. Yeah, but oh, that's okay. okay I've just been up and down. Oh. <laughs> You'll find right, it. Which one's that then? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, something's watching. Is the is the hint to where the sp the spelling mistake is? Oh bloody hell! <laughs> ah, Ubble. Yeah. That's I was right. trying to, What happened was I was, trying, I was trying to get it up for eleven eleven. I was trying to get it up for 11 11, right? And I was running out of time. I was scanning through it, making sure everything was right. And I corrected 
Which was a corrected one that was wrong, and I didn't see that one, so. Right. Yeah, I bet it's even wrong on the flipping. Never mind. You get the point. What one would you like me to play first? I'll let you choose, because you're the uh, author. It depends what's... what's... Hubble. Oh, I don't know. Uh, if you like it. Sorry. Should we do the Hubble? The spelling mistake. We one. sort of got to, yeah, yeah haven't we? Why, Why not? We've got to do that one now. We've got to hear it now. All right, let's give it a whirl. Yeah, really good. Actually, that was um, surprising me, actually. I was expecting that to be some sort of um, ambient thing, and it was a real banger, that one. Well done, mate. Well done. Very nice. It, it, um, it, love it the mix, too. Off, it starts off very... Um, it sort of grows. The sort of middle of the album is sort of more dancey like that, and then the end of the album is more sort of... Um, how can I put it? Sort of more trancey, but still, it's still got the kick drum running through most of them, so it's still, still got that beat. Um, but yeah, so it starts off, flows into sort of the main sort of like Hubble's watching, uh, bedding one, which is another banging one. 
um, and then goes to like sort of Earth's Cry, which is very uh, solar stony vibe, um, piano-y and chilled. And then it works into the last one, Voices, to the uh, ever-growing expanse, which will then go into the EPs. So, yeah. It's quite a, quite a good 120 minutes or so, 110, something like that. So you can get a long journey in the car with that. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Um, anything else we, we should play quickly? I mean, how long have we got? Oh, we've got about three minutes. We could probably uh, squeeze another minute or so out of uh, this. I don't know. Try, try Earth's Cry because it's got some piano. I might like the piano on that. All right, let's do that. Beautiful. Uh, and obviously, if you want to check out the rest of that, you know where to go. In fact, um, where to go is uh, darrenthouse.bandcamp.com. Uh, I'm actually I'm going to copy the link and paste straight into the chat for you guys. Let's see if this works. If not, it'll post my bank account details. Just kidding. Well, hey, um, wee, there we go. In the chat. So head, head on over to that. Don't head on there yet. Head on after the show. Uh, send some money <laughs> towards Darren for making 17 amazing tracks. It does sound really good, mate. Absolutely brilliant. It's free. Oh, I'll send you some money. Send you some money. 17 tracks are free, pure, banging, chill out, trans, <laughs> you name it. Just just my style. I don't know. I haven't got a genre, has it? Because they, they, they blend, so. Yeah. Who cares about yeah. genres? Just Just... Just go and get it. What's what's the harm? You, you've, you've got some music for, for free and you can sit there for 120 odd minutes. Beautiful. Or you can leave it on in the background and then walk off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. We should start the main show because we can and it's my show. Here we go. Glad of you to join us on another beautiful Saturday. Um, it doesn't matter what type of weather it is where you are, it's still beautiful. In fact, um, it's really lovely to have you and it's also lovely to have these fantastic gentlemen join us as well as they do uh, quite regularly and some of them more than regular. Anyway, it's uh, it's the main show. You've, uh, you've reached that part of it um, for those who have just started to jump in. I've noticed that the numbers are growing around about this time. It's the two o'clock uh, UK time, the one that we advertise anyway. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Let's have a quick look at the chatties. There they are, big awesome chatties in all their wonderful glory. 
um, doing everything that they do so well each week. Um, I've said hello to most of you. Um, a couple have popped in afterwards, like Adam Matt, Ad, um, yeah. Adamski, Adam, it's nice to see you. Ken Lewis, uh, Adsy Fadzy, uh, uh, Andy from uh, who's Synthetic is there, and um, a few other people jumped in. I can't remember off the top of my head who they were, but um, I think David, I didn't say hello to David, so big hello to David anyway. I think he's just jumped in. Yes, uh, lots of people like to put their name as it's scrolling here right now. <laughs> That's one. My <laughs> name's on the internet. Look at me. me. <laughs> um, uh, beautiful. It's always cool to see the same people. We like to see you all. And we like to see new people too, obviously. But We like to see new and old. Yes. Yeah. 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 No? Okay. Um, well, Andy, why don't you tell us how your week's been since you've got the floor? Have I? Am I on the floor? Oh, right. How am I? Yes. Uh, uh, it's just, everything is is just so, oh, the right words. Um, right. I'll Adjectives put it, put time. Put it this way. Right. Um, Pants. I haven't got the adjectives for it. Yeah, basically. Uh, just hard work. Just, I, I'm, I'm going Shot. to work early. I'm leaving late. I'm getting home, and I and I'm just I'm not fit for anything. I uh, I started to put together a little video for you, like I said I would, but then I couldn't find the power <laughs> supply for this stupid little box. Uh, where have I put this power supply? So I could, so whilst I could do a nice film, I couldn't do any. I, thought I couldn't plug it in. So that went up the chuffing swanny. I've no idea where this power supply has gone. It's got to be in here somewhere because it's not been anywhere in thirty years. Oh. I just, uh, five years. Um, so I, th I thought I'd do that. And that <laughs> went out. Uh, I managed, <clears throat> after doing lots of various sort of battles, I've managed to, to the old old digital tracks, all the ones that were recorded onto CD or onto DAT, my old tracks, uh, I managed to, uh, off me dad, there you go, thank you dad for lending me this, uh, a nice C external USB CD drive. So I managed to get them all up and I've just been working through those just sort of tidying them up a bit uh, but that's taken longer than I was thinking so they're definitely not up and ready but hopefully by this time next week they will be up and ready and on bank camp but they'll, they're just going to sound pants after what Darren's just shown us and we've used the adjective pants once we might as well use it again <laughs> but still uh, I'll stick those up and if anybody really wants them feel free to download them again they'll be free you don't have to pay for those so they'll, they'll go up um, but yeah, other than that, I, I'm just, I can't wait for next Friday. Honestly, I just cannot wait for next Friday to come. Then, oh. Then it's semester break, anyway, is it? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's two and a bit weeks off, and that'll be, and I bloody well need it, I'll tell you, because I feel like I've been hit by a bloody truck. Mm. Yes. Um, well, it's end of year for us. Um, my All of my children have finished school for the year, uh, except one, I've got one still in prime, like junior primary school, um, and he'll he'll finish, I think, Thursday. So I'll have all the kids at home as of next week. Don't forget, next Saturday will be our Christmas show. Um, but before we talk about that, we've already said hello to Darren, but we'll say hello to him officially because it is the main show. Darren, nice of you to join us, mate. How's your week been? Uh, not like Andy's anyway. Uh, it's not been as bad as Andy's anyway. Uh, That's it's good. It's not been pants. Good. It's been hectic though, uh, and also I need a proofreader, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a Hubble <because> proofreader. <laughs> I've been yes. Um, I won't be surprised if it uh, if I actually had it spelled and then un uh, corrected it to wrong spelling. I don't know. Um, but I was rushing to get this. I won't say rushing. That's not quite the right word. But I was rushing to get it. Track. Um, can't know. Track nine. Planet Nine was an absolute nightmare to get to get right. I think it's about six six different versions. I just couldn't get it how I wanted it, and there's some <laughs> problems with it. So I was rushing to get it out because last week, if you've seen the video, I put out a sort of cryptic clue of to when it was actually going to come out. Um, and if you look at the numbers, uh, it sort of says it. So I was hoping to get it out for eleven eleven, which I just about did. So I was rushing because it was probably about eight minutes past 11 and I haven't even got all the tracks quite loaded up yet. So 
I rushed through it, I give it a quick check, I assumed everything was right, and then banged it out. So, yeah, it's been quite hectic the last few days trying to get it all ready, as well as writing other stuff um, for other albums and things. So, yeah, uh, above than that, it's been it's been good, been cold, wet, but you know, it's been it's been uh, tiring in a different way to Andy. Mine's just been trying to write everything and get it done as best as I can, as quick mm. as I can. Because when you make a deadline, you know this fans. When you make a deadline, then you suddenly realise that you might not make that deadline. It's a bit of a pain, <laughs> especially when you put out to everyone, hoping mm-hmm. that they don't grasp when it is. Uh, don't be too so, hard on yourself, um, mate. You've done well. You've done extremely well. I think a lot of people are um, envious of the effort that you, you do every week as it is, and now to bang out 17 tracks and more stuff to come. Uh, I think it's been brilliant, mate. Been brilliant. Well done. Um, well, I hope, I, hope, <clears throat> I hope anyone who gets it, uh, and if they do pay for it, thank you very much. Cause I think Robbie's already uh, bought it. I'm not sure. I'm sure I'll put it, yes. Uh, so anyone who does get it, say, even if you just get it for free, it's just worth a listen. And, you know, you might oh, like it. I will be listening to it. Put. Do not worry. There'll be a few of us listening to it, that's for sure. Hopefully more than a few. Um, we're going to say hello to Henrik because uh, he's been sitting here longer than you two uh, and he deserves to have a say. How you been, mate? Nice to have you back. Um yeah, thank you. Um, first, before I say that, um, about the power supply, Andy, if it's for Volca, I may have a suggestion. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been uh, sick. It's not for Henrik. About no, 10 it, days. It, no. <laughs> Good for it, you. It, unfortunately, <laughs> it, it's, it's, not for a, it's not for a Volca. They'd be too easy to guess anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But but I've been sick for ten days and um, ouch. Um, it it's it's a big problem um, because I I I have a problem sleeping with snoring and and remember to breathe. So I sleep with a machine to help me with that, and um, I can't use it when I'm sick. So I can't mm. sleep at nights. Um, mm. um, so so it's this night I I fell asleep about uh, 10 a.m. and got up again at 12. So, yeah, that's how it is at the moment. And um, it was getting better yesterday, but this night was bad. Uh, I hope it, it it's over Monday. I already called in to say I'm well Monday, but I'm not sure. Um, let's see. But, well, but we hope but you are. The evenings are fine. Yeah, we all hope you are, mate. It's not nice to be ill, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's um, from from us, we're all grateful for what you've done with today's show, uh, all the effort that you've put into getting the interview with Ian done. Um, and obviously we're, we're playing uh, the rest of that after we get through our main segments just about to start now. Um, so it's exciting. The actual the meat and potatoes part's about to come, which is the next segment. So um, we should... Uh, Hold our breaths. No, we will go purple if we do that. Why don't we go straight into the usual segments? And the first one, uh, Henrik, is usually called which? Put you on the spot there. What's the first segment called? Uh, uh, (laughs) I can't remember. (laughs) Starts with an F. I have mastering in my head, so. Starts with an F. um, F. um... Makes you laugh. (laughs) He's not well. It's not well. It makes you laugh. <laughs> How about we just do this? <laughs> Put him out of his misery. Uh, yes, funny side it was. Uh, and it wasn't a trick question at all. Uh, it's just um, it's one of those things <laughs> when people put you on the spot. And if you have been paying attention, um, these things are called memes and they do kind of creep into our inboxes during the week. Now, these ones, I don't know if I laughed at any of them, but I did think they were worthy of showing you and sharing anyway. I guess you could say things are getting pretty serious. Now, what he's doing, if you haven't worked this out, is he's pulling the protective plastic thing off the LCD screen. And isn't that, isn't that a great feeling when you do that? You're just like, ah, it's that sort of feeling of you pulling off. <laughs> I remember I did a video a couple of years ago where um, I've had a, a microcorg for many, many, many years and I left that protective film on there. And actually one of my, one of my friends who works in the electronics says, you shouldn't leave those things on because they can actually, um, depending on how badly they made, if they're really cheap adhesives and plastics, they can actually damage your screen. So you should actually pull them off. 
Um, but anyway, I pulled it off. It was a nice. It was a nice feeling. Um, you guys ever had that nice feeling when you pull <laughs> off your? That's a bit dodgy. That one's a bit dodgy, is it? Yeah. <laughs> all right. How about we go with this one? It is if we all sample it and put things together. The four B's of music. You got B natural, <laughs> B flat, B sharp, and the neighbour yelling out, <laughs> "Be quiet!" That's a good one. I like that. Yes, very clever. Uh, These people have got no time on their hands at all, have they? Ah, what a beautiful day. Let's pull down the blinds. There's also written called Be, be Gone or something like that. <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, eat, sleep, edit, repeat. Hey, it sounds like me when I'm doing videos for YouTube. Ah, uh, dearie me. Um, let's hope that's is not that you, case. Darren. It looks a bit like Darren. Yeah, it up. was actually just on that one track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that, the studio looks right. a bit. The studio looks a bit, bit too big to be Darren. So, anyway, um, yeah, right. There's, there's plenty more room. It can stand up for a start. <laughs> Welcome to heaven. Here's our synth collection. What the? It's only Beringer clones, and he pulls the mask off. <laughs> That's not very nice. <laughs> that is not very nice. <clears throat> That's horrible. Who, pre who does well, this stuff? Who does these sort of things? By the way, these aren't made by me. Uh, disclaimer: No one, no one, sue me, please. Um, I'm just showing you what goes across my inbox. Um, anyway, I didn't have to show you that. Uh, I guess um, <laughs> I have to say something about me remembering it, uh, the funny side, mm. uh, the name. Um, one of my problems <laughs> amongst all the others um, is HDH, DHD. Ah. Um, so, so when I see a title like Funny Side, I see it as Bunny Side and everything else. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you don't need so, to explain. so remembering that it is Funny Side is sometimes difficult. Yeah, you don't need to explain. We are all, all over it in like a microsecond after we hit the button. Do not worry about it at all. Um, what was your favorite meme this week? Any of them? B flat. Oh. B flat was mine. Yeah. Yeah, B flat. Also, the uh, screen taking the thing off the screen cover because I remember doing that on the AM One X. I had it on for ages. I didn't yeah. even know there was one on there. And then after a while, I went, "God, this screen is so awful. I hate it." And then I realised that it was actually <laughs> something that stuck on it. Yeah, I've had something to me before. Yeah, but, but when yeah. when I see such a film uh, being taken off, I always all, also think about hair removal, and I don't like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is very interesting. Is this the Brazilian is this like a Brazilian sort of thing theme we've got going on here or what? <laughs> no, it's just HDHD. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh Brazilian screen covers. Um hi to all the Brazilian viewers watching. Um anyway, we should <laughs> we should move along before this train wrecks anymore. We do have news, believe it or not. How do we manage to get news every week? I do not know. In the middle of a pandemic as well. My goodness me. Well, why don't we start off with a little video, if I can get the mouse to work. Little video, please. Now, I don't know if I'm gonna watch this uh, nine minute long video, but if, if you are thinking about this, this is the latest module from Phase Lunaire. This is called the Vega. What is this? What is it? Does anyone know? What is it? Sort of kick drum. Sounds like a CR78. It's, it's a drum module, yes, you got it. With four digital voices. And basically, you can tailor those voices to whatever you want. You can either put synths in there or samples in there. Um, each voice consists of a digital oscillator, multiple waveforms, sign, square, ramp, noise, or a sample source. And you can load samples straight forward from the SD card, which is up the top left hand corner. You can see the little slot there. Beautiful. I actually been thinking about getting something like this, but I thought four was a little bit. Um, on the light side, I thought you know you might need more than four voices. But notice how he's got two modules. 
next to each other. Good idea. Anyway, uh, let's turn that off for a sec because it's annoying me. Um, basically, you have got, <laughs> sorry, um, you've got the idea anyway. That's a uh, side on view of the module. You can see the depth of it there. Um, it's very, very similar to the Pico drums, I will admit. The only difference, obviously, to the Pico drums to this is that you can load the samples directly on uh, via the SD card, but the actual, um, the little, you saw me tweaking the little knobs to get the difference in uh, sample lengths and things like that. Very similar. And I think if you've and got two of them, six HP. six HP is cool. Yeah, six HP is very cool. Um, oh, how much is it? Yes. 250 euros is a little bit on the pricey side, but that's not too bad. Yeah, it is. It's not too yeah, bad. It's not, yeah. it's not an awful lot more for the QD. Mm. Uh, which is a bigger module, but, bigger module, which is again only four and it's quad drum, but you've got all the different editing knobs around it. I'm now going to sneeze. Editing sneezing knobs. Yes. Uh, I have it too. Yeah. Um, um, this, this model, does, does it have uh, external tricks or, or is it only outputs? It has, um, what did I, I say? It had some, uh, quite a bunch of stuff down the bottom and I didn't quite get a chance to have a look at it. Where are we? In fact, we, we did have a web page, didn't we? Or did I not load that? I, I wonder if it works with an internal clock or probably. It works with, clock. it works with CV clock. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Right. I don't think I don't think so, it has so so you program it oh, in, in the model module. Is it not a separate trigger for each uh, drum voice then? If it if, if it has four outs, then then it, there's not space for um, four triggers. Uh, I think it's a bit like the QD. I think it looks like it's got four triggering. Has it got four trigger inputs? And then and then a, yeah. an output. The QD two has, outs has and four. one or two. Yeah. All right, let's answer those questions because I didn't actually know the answers. Um, <laughs> 12 parameters per voice, uh, pitch, pitch envelope, cutoff, filter, um, uh, volume and waveform, dual mode filter, two encoders, da, 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 uh, performance muting, random, tr random trigger. There is an additional trigger input that allows for creation of random sequences. So that kind of is what you were saying. Henrik, um, yeah. hmm. um, outputs, where's, uh, the, where's the connections on this thing? Hello, connections. Yeah. Four trigger inputs, one oh, for each voice. One. Let's scroll on. That's uh, not telling yeah. us. That's so four trigger inputs. And Can you I find guess... it on model grid? Try to add it to model grid up uh, at the right. I can do that. I can do anything. Uh, there was um, a shortcut at the right. Uh, oh, there was? Okay. Yeah. Modular grid where? Uh, up, up. There. There. At the modular grid. Hmm. There you, you should be able to zoom on that image, can't you? Yeah, but there's nothing written on uh, there. No. And, it did, and it said that on the modules too. Hang on, oh, maybe it's that's just bloody typical. Yeah, but but, but the way they are colored, uh, it seems like there's one output and five inputs. Um, yes, yeah, they did say four four way. triggers plus a random. Four triggers yeah. plus a random, so five triggers and one output. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, you got it. All right, yeah. cool. We're done. Yay. Um, next, next hmm. was. Uh, Interesting. Next was interesting. So next was, um, I'm just going to put it over the, the face of us because it can do that nicely, is from AM Synths, and he's the guy that helped Beringer make the 2500 and I think the 2600 as well. Um, anyway, so this is actually a little percussive keyboard module that hooks in with, there is a Beringer module called the 1047 and it's a state variable filter. Um, and I've got one here in my nifty case. Uh, which one is it? It is that one there. Let me go there. Oops, turn that off. 
Need to get rid of mouse. There we go. So that one, where is it there? Is the bearing module, the 1047, the state variable filter. Straighten that up. Hold it steady. There you go. Um, now, that is actually a really, really nice sounding filter module because it is, it is modeled after the um, uh, 2500. But what does this do? This is actually like a, a keyboard percussion feature. Now, the thing is that I think the 2500 actually had this feature and Behringer didn't add this. I don't know if it's because it was part of uh, a sort of sequence mapping thing that they had. Um, not 100%, some, someone who's really up with the 2500 will be able to tell us. But basically what you can do with this is you can input um, uh, connecting the module to gate and pitch signals of your keyboard and it then controls um, what, the, the, the key sort of percussive features of that filter. Um, which is actually one of the benefits that the 2500 had um, that you kind of didn't really have in a 2600, really, when you think about it. You didn't actually really have this. So this is kind of like a, an interesting thing. I'd be interested to see what the chatty say about this because I would definitely be getting myself one of these because I've, I've already gone the rab down the rabbit hole of the 2500 modules. Um, yes, murder case, yes. Um, I have to put modules somewhere when I'm not using them. <laughs> so the nifty case has got the job at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, no one's talking about it yet. Okay, so obviously not a real big 2500 following there. So it's, I don't really understand it, Rans. Is it just a, a, a filter? It's just a, a, I mean, I don't understand the keyboard percussion thing. I mean, so, is it just to make... So you're pinging, you're pinging the filter. You're, it's like um, you're creating p percussive ringing tones. Yeah, so you, you, you know, yeah, yeah. You're, it's got. It's like there's actually sound generating capabilities in that filter module, the 1047 that Behringer have remade, and that gives you the op the op the option to to do that, tap into that with these, you know, the resonance and final cue settings, um, and you you know your gate and that sort of stuff. So you, you hook that up together. There's um, there isn't One a video. We're, we're there isn't a video yet, so I can't really show you more than that. Uh, while while we are at that, um, can you explain what a low pass gate is? I I don't understand the reason for having a low pass gate. Yep. Um, the best. Okay, so the low pass gate is on, like for example, the mutable instruments um, plats module. Uh, braids and it's also on bearing your brains um, and what it does is it gives you the ability to um, not have to use an envelope generator to shorten the length of a sound uh, where you can get it to be really percussive really short and and uh, plucky or you can extend at like a normal sort of tone sort of sound and that's what a low pass gate does and it uses the the um, the curve of a low pass filter to um, to provide that gate signal for it. So it's kind of, it's not like square. It's not like square gate. It's kind of rounded a bit. So it kind of, it does have an envelope sort of feel to it. Does that make sense? That's probably, it probably didn't describe mm, yeah, it 100% right. Of, but, but I'm also, yeah, but I'm also thinking about why they made it uh, at first, the first time they ever made such a thing. Um, was it because they wanted to filter out noise to not trigger a gate? Um, I, I, yeah, yeah, I just think was, about how, how they invented it. Why by, they invented it. Mm. it was sort of developed by Don Buckler, really, wasn't it? Uh, originally, it was part of Don Buckler's system. Um, quite how and why he came around to that way of doing it, rather than like a, a Moog's ladder filter. Uh, that there were the, all these people that were working quite independently of each other in different parts of America, in different parts mm. of the world, and they were all coming up with similar <laughs> ideas, but with different implementations. And, and the low pass gate was something that, that Buckler put onto his early systems. Now, an interesting one, actually, yeah, Native VS, who's in the chat, 
he'll probably know the reason for the low pass gate is Don. Yeah, Don Buckler's brain. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, Don Buckler's idea. So I mean, Native VS will be able to tell us probably more because mm. his his knowledge about such things is is amazing. It's encyclopedic. But, but, so, engi but so, engineering uh, speak aside, Andy. Engineering speak aside, the the sound of a low pass gate. Not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The sound of a low pass gate kind of is more like a snappy envelope. That that's kind of the best way to describe yeah. it, in my opinion, because you okay, you're nice. using yeah. you're using that to get those really percussive sounds, which really does lead us back to why that um, AM synth module exists. It's so that you can percussively play the filter, and that filter is insanely like capable. It's like one of the I have to say at the moment it's probably my favourite filter. It's actually my favourite filter before the, this uh, 2500 stuff came out um, in my world, I mean, it's been out for years, but in my particular world here, uh, was the Moog filter, of course, but actually I love that 1047 filter. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and I no doubt when someone remakes uh, a Cynthia or a VCS3, that will probably surpass that as well because the filters and those things are, are crazy good too. Anyway, so Chaddy's yeah, the saying. I, I still don't get it um, because if you filter uh, a square, you you will slew it. You will yep. make it soft. Yes. So why why does it get snappy? I don't get that. Uh, no, you, th there's there's a length to the gate as well as um, as the slewness of it. So the filter, Na like native, like native VS yes. said, is is they use vectorals, which gives you that slew behavior. Yeah. Um, which is what I mentioned before. It kind of curves off the edges, so you're not. It's not a straight uh, square wave type, you know, gate. Because gates are square waves usually, right? On and off. Mm. Um, so the the low pass filter side of it, it just it just um, smooths it off, and the and the smoothing can be adjusted as well, depending on what type of low pass filter gate you've got. Sorry, what pass? What am I saying? Low pass filter, low pass gate you've got. Um, some give you more controls than others. Um, but yeah, if you've got a, um, a mutable instruments plats or braids or a bearing of brains or anything along those sort of lines, um, have a play with that low pass gate on that. It's actually really, really good fun. Definitely. Um, okay. uh, I, I think I will have to get a low pass gate to, to get it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one, Henry. <laughs> get one. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> And interestingly, the native VS is saying that they're never snappy. Um, yeah, look, I I always thought of them as being um, an envelope replacement, and as a result, usually they get used for more percussive duties than anything. So I don't know, that's just me. Um, they really, really sound beautiful though. Um, so the the best way to to, to do it is to um, is to get something that doesn't have a low pass gate. And then have something that does have a low pass gate and play the same oscillator or whatever through that particular thing and then compare it and then you'll see you'll hear sorry the difference between it. one's kind of definitely on and off and the other one's got a bit of a smoothness to it it's probably the best way to describe it all right we had digressed too much we need to go back to news and we're going to do this ST modular. Um, what is this thing? This is the Clipping Cat. It's a DIY. Oh, this is going to be loud. This is a vectoral based distortion unit for your modular. We're talking about distortion a couple of weeks ago. Tiny little unit, it's 4 HP. Nice way to think of that module is I would like to have some sort of overdrive or, I mean, in this case it's clipping, but some sort of way I can control that. So that is a pretty interesting module in that sense because you've got um, a gain control, a level control, 
And you can also uh, CV control those as well. Um, and that means then you can pass that back through effects as well. So it's kind of not, um, you can put it sort of before the effects change or before, even before like a filter if you wanted to. Um, so that, that sort of stuff is quite interesting. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think of these, these new sort of distortion and gain <laughs> clipping with, type modules? Darren? I'm with Wagyu on this one. What did I'm with Wagyu on this one. I'd, uh, he said uh, I'd get it just for the uh, the LED cat lights. <laughs> it's in his eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, pretty yeah. cool. It always tell me something if it's got really cool lads and things. <laughs> it is pretty cool. Um, yeah, that there's the, just in front of your face there. Actually, it's almost where your eyes are, Darren. There, look at that, hey? Playing that earlier. Yeah. Um, no, but Darren, do you, do you like the sound of it? Please, please, come on. We are a synth show. <laughs> yes, because actually, actually, yeah, I do actually. I could, I could use that in the, my next album. Very spacey, I can make that. But yeah, I quite like it. Like I say, I mean, no, because that'll be that'll, that'll go down max if I go. Eh, it's all right, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's this factual stuff, right? So this gets this does kind of get electronic engineering talk again. These guys are talking about vectoral distortion. So, um, yeah, it's it's using that type of engineering to create a distortion, filth, and grit into your tone. Um, uh, so it's got diode clipping, soft and hard clipping. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, someone who's into engineering will might may be able to sort of uh, I think I think it all comes down to, do you like the sound of it? Do you like what it does? Sorry, what was that, Henrik? Um an MS20 filter works with clipping and the filter um and the feedback. Yeah. Um so I think it's what they're thinking about there. Yeah. So it also has wrong polarity protection and it is four HP wide, which I said before. Um, yeah, so what are the chatties saying about Vactral? Anything? Go and try and talk about Vactral. I remember talking about Vactral once and I've completely forgotten about half the stuff that I learned about it. It's, you know, one of those things where you learn something and then you follow it away in the depths of your memory banks in your head somewhere and it never comes back, uh, especially when you get to my age. Um, anyway. Um, one thing. Um, I have a, a strange feeling about uh, distortion. Mm. Um, um, we we worked for years to remove distortion and noise, and now we want to add it. Mm. We can just uh, do a bad bad um, level between each model of models, each of the models, and and then we can get the distortion. I don't know. I don't understand why we need all those models to do that when we can do we it. We can do it ourselves, but I think I think what it's about, Henrik, I think yeah. it's more about controlling it. It's about being Eurorack is about being in control and having the tools there to use if we don't, patch in if we do, you know what I mean? It's more about it's there and it does that. Uh, and not everyone knows how to do what you've just said either. So that it's this is something where they can just patch something through. It does what it's supposed to do, and we're on our way. Um, remember, there's, there's, a, there's a, a vast majority of people that use Eurorack that probably don't understand half of the stuff, what they've got in front of them, what it does. They just, they're after the sound, they get the module because it does what it's supposed to do. And then, you know. Lots of lights. <laughs> yep. Lots of light. I'm probably, I'm probably a little bit in that. <laughs> I'm we probably like, a little bit like in cable. that. No, no, don't, don't say you like cables. Rob, you'll have up a place. Yeah, Rob, you'll have it. All right. That oh, by the way, that module is um, it's a DIY project. I don't know if it's it's available soon, so we don't have a price. I don't think there's a price on that. Sorry, um, but yeah, you can check it out on ST Modular's website. Let's go to this one. Uh, this is a Bifarco module. This is another DIY. If you want, you can get them to make these. By the way, it's not just DIY. Um, and this one is a noise plethora.
This is a three channel noise generator with a ton of selectable flavors. You can select algorithms with your knob. <laughs> or, <laughs> or you can use the CV controls. You've been um, saving that all week, haven't you, Ron? Yes, I have. It's got a decent sized knob there. Uh, the strength of this module is not just the colourful plethora of noise algorithms, but the hybrid architecture. Besides these, each channel has an analog multi-mode filter that gives you the noise sources of warmth and additional shaping. Noise always sounds good through a filter, so uh, I think it's a very sensible thing to do. Um, the different types of noises, though, are actually pretty, pretty clever. Uh, this is a bit pricey though, 350 euros if you want this one. Um, I, I find a lot of uh, Bifaco stuff to be um, in the higher end of, of the sort of Eurorack sort of pricing, but they do make some really, really, really good stuff. Like it's high end quality gear. Um, you know, a lot of people will, will sing those praises as well. Um, noises can be really, really important. We did a show about noises a while ago. So um, what do you guys think about this? Noise plethora. I'm gonna go with you, Andy. I know you've got your opinion about noises. Right. Yeah, I think this thing sounds great. And it's on my, it's another one I've just added to the list. Oh, brilliant. Um, there's been a couple of videos this week which have featured this module. Uh, Robin Vincent did one. And also uh, Mylar Melodies with mm. the same, the, Saw that. the yep. same Bifaco module. Uh, and what was interesting was how different it sounds in each of their hands. Different so, hands, yeah. Robin's doing his thing, mm. and and and, and that, I enjoyed that a lot. And I was thinking, yeah, this I can see this. Uh, certainly, as I'm, I'm quite interested in in things like the Basimilar to Teratus Alta and and, and mm. those type of modules for you know again just interesting weird percussion noises, things that are not obvious. Because I okay, I mean I've got the QD. The QD does does all sorts of interesting weird things, but it's essentially sort of drums. I know you can put your own samples and stuff in it. I've not got to that bit yet with I've not got to that stage. Cool. But I do like I really do like the look of this uh, mm. this module. Uh, I mean like a lot of Bifaco stuff, it's not exactly cheap, but then again you, you know, especially if you have one that's that's built rather than a kit. Mm. So I, I don't, I, there's no way I'd be building one of these myself. I, I think it sounds sounds fab. I think it, it, yeah, mm. definitely definitely one I'm keeping my eyes on. Let's have a little look at it um, while we're there. Sorry, because um, the video wasn't quite that clear with all the cables plugged into it. Even though they did a nice job of neatening their cables up. Um, shut up, Robbie. Um, we've got uh, the X Y. You know the inputs, you've got XY, XA and XB, so there's two lots of XY inputs. Um, and you've got the big cutoff knobs for the two circuits there. I like I like its layer, I think it's it's intuitive. I, um, yeah, and obviously it's got a digital engine behind it, which is that where you see in the middle with the programming knob um, yeah. that you can select different programming for it. Yeah, look, I think in terms of whether it does like a Bismuth Iteratus, uh, alter or mine is just the iteratus. Um, I, I think it's probably not quite going to do what that does because that does some crazy sort of FME oh, yeah. sort of stuff. Um, but you probably yeah. you probably get some it's interesting, intriguing. yeah, probably get some interesting stuff. Cool, cool. Right, that's it. We done? No, was there one more? There was. Uh, <laughs> Well, there was one more. I don't know if, if, I, if I've got a graphic for it, but it's this one. This is the Cosmotronic. Oh, all Eurorack. Hooray. It's all Eurorack this week. Sorry, guys. Or firmware updates. Which would you prefer? Eurorack, always. I'm thinking about getting their mixer. It's very nice. So this is a side chainy jobber. Mm -hmm. well, there's it's actually, got me. There's actually, <laughs> it's quite nice, isn't it? There's actually two modules here. There's is it? the, there's the Mesa, and there's the Peridum. Um, 
Yeah, it's interesting because I was looking at this. I, I was wondering why there aren't more Eurorack compressors. There are some, um, but I think there'd be more of them. Uh, mm. And definitely, I mean, I've, I've not seen this one, so that's definitely interesting. It's, and, de- and certainly if you can side chain it, you can put your paddy things through and then side chain yep. it. Yeah, definitely interested in that. I hope it's not stupidly expensive, though. What I was trying to find out, though, is um, what they base the compressor on, because they don't really tell us that here. Um, it's They're saying the analog, the core is analog, and it's a VCA-based feed-forward compressor. Right, so they're telling us what engineering-wise what it is. So it's a VCA-based feed-forward compressor with a low noise signal path. But what is it based on? Because usually compressors come from some sort of, you know, influence somewhere because presses have been around for a long time um be nice to know what they based it on or unless it's their own invention i don't think so um yeah you do have that very Lots high rate prices you're Lots looking of, at yeah, uh, 219 euros for the mesa and 265 euros for the paradam which is the um the thing i haven't shown you yet cool um, if you compare that to the Golden Master, it's 189. Um, it can do both compression in three bands and EQ in three bands and um, uh, imaging uh, uh, side side bands. Who's the Golden side. Master by? Mid side, yeah. Who's that by? Golden Master. The Golden Master is from Endorphin. Yes. Oh, oh yes. Endorphins, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was one I did look at. And, and it's Didn't really understand a lot about it. If you can explain it. Mm. Yeah, it's actually meant to be in the end of the chain, but but you can put it in the middle, and 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 it's it's a stereo model, so so you can do double uh, uh, in, compared to the one you just shown. Mm. Um, yeah, good good comparison. Um, uh, there's also one new version of that. Did you know, I actually didn't actually talk about this on the news because I've run out of spots to talk about stuff, but um, there's a whole bunch of new end orphan modules that have come out that are one new as well. Um, and we can probably, maybe we should put that on next week's show, but um, the one new modules are more those, um, this is the thing too. I don't know if it's IntelliGel one new or tip top, whatever it is. Or there's another form of one U because there's two different one U's now, which is annoying actually because Eurorack was supposed to be kind of a standard, and all of a sudden there's two different one U's out. Um, it'd be nice to to know which version the one U is, but um, uh, I might be able to get a photo of that for you, show you what it looks like as a one U because that would actually be pretty cool. I can show. Okay, I've got it here. Okay. This is not the best photo either because they always put heaps of crap around it. Why can't you just take a photo of it so we can look at it? Anyway, there's a one new version, right? And the uh, original, what is it? The normal 3U HP version. It's the black with the gold lettering. Looks like this. So that's the one you're talking about. I don't know if you can see my screen share. I have it too. Um, the 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 three unit, yeah, three unit heights. You can screen share. Go. Ahead. Yeah. I don't know if you're showing it. I can only see. <laughs> no, I can only I'm see showing. your face. Yeah, we can only see your okay, face. Okay. 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 Um, no big deal. Oh, I ha- oh no, I no now I'm sharing and then to the model there. There you go. Let's do that again. Doop. It's a nice looking box. Yeah. Indeed. What is that? What and is that? Com- back, on- what is that compressor based on, Henry? Oh, ooh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, on the back, there's uh, 
uh, opportunities to to either set it for for um, for CV no um, modular levels or or line levels. Um, so you can use it uh, with, with external equipment or internally in your rack. It's interesting because they on their website they say it takes its compressor from inspiration from studio mastering and radio loudness units from the 1990s. And they actually say it a couple of times. They say, um, you can see it says on their website, it says multi-based processor inspired by mastering tools from the 1990s adds punch and dynamics to your sound. Yes, but what? What are you, what inspiration? Who? Not just, uh, uh, I mean, it could be anything. Yeah, yeah. What was around? On, there was heaps of stuff around in the 90s. It's, it's a brick wall limiter. Yeah. They actually do say that separately. Yeah. It's a brick wall limiter. Yeah. yeah. Which is, is kind of logic because it's meant to be in the end uh, of, of the signal. Of your chain, yeah. Before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That might, that might actually be a bit of a difference between that and the Mesa that we showed before. So where, where compressors actually get used, where they fit in, maybe um, you may want a compressor to not be on the end of your chain. You can change it back to your screen sharing, back to your face if you want, Henry. Um, yeah, yeah. I, so, I yeah. But the, the, the two of them, you know, may, may work well together. You, you know, you can, yeah, we're, talking, we're going to be talking about compressing later on the show. We should probably actually move on because we're going to be here forever otherwise. Um, I need to get on to the next segment, <laughs> which is this. Uh, price watch and um, it is always met with wonderful wonderful cheers when we talk about who's trying to rip us off every week uh, these are all brought to us by Andy who's synthetic who's already in the chat room let's have a quick look at this I thought we'd do an Oberheim special this week 12 and a half grand for an OBXA this one's coming from where is it coming from in Boston Massachusetts Hello to all my friends from Boston. Beautiful. If you've yeah. got 12 and a half grand and an extra 500 for shipping, so 13 grand, you can get yourself an OBXA. Hey, hey. Or, wow. speaking of Oberheims, you could also get the SEM Pro. Oh, that's a, that's a new one, isn't it? That's not a vintage one, that's a new one. That's the new one. <clears throat> I had to look twice yeah. when you said that, but because it's got the signature. Yeah, tomoberheim.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got the signature down the bottom as well. And um, there's a small difference to the layout on that as well, isn't there? Yeah, that one's from Berlin. What else we got? An expander. Yummy. Oh, I'd definitely give one of those house room, but not for $9,000. Yeah, it's been, it's it's had a $3,000 price drop though. That's good. I mean, you know, it's nice. it's it's <laughs> rushing out the door now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, dear collectors, here Just for sale my Oberheim. This was um this is an Italian lister, so that would probably be Google Translate, no doubt. Um, Anybody yeah. any idea how much a Matrix a Matrix thousand goes for these days? The nineteen inch rack unit. Oh, it'd be more than that. No, it won't be more than nine thousand. No, not the Matrix thousand. I've no, seen the I've idiot. seen the Oberheim no. stuff go for crazy money now. It's it's really getting stupid. Oh. Yeah, it's getting it's yeah, it's well, like another ABXA. Well, it's Jupiter Eight. I mean, it's the you thing know, all the stuff's getting stupid. It is getting stupid. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. The OBXA, I'd love one, but mm. not for that money. Yeah, yeah. So I if you why, why wouldn't you just? Sorry, I was going to say. I know there's a thing about owning the original thing, but for, in, in terms of common sense, if you if you really want it, go and buy uh, the the OB6. Surely yeah. it's a good idea. Uh, Wagyu just said I paid about four hundred for his Matrix thousand. Wagyu, how long ago? Hmm. Uh, I mean, because again, I reckon the prices may have. I've seen up. some. I've seen about them go for thousands. Has been. I've seen them go for thousands. So it depends on really? what we're talking about. Um. Any any more comments on the price watch? We'll just see what the chatties have got to say quickly. Yeah. 
just going to say to native VS, yes, I, I, I tend to agree with you, really. In this day and age, you're probably right about that. Mm. There you go. Yeah, for, for a thousand quid for a Matrix Thousand is too much, really. Hang on to your obies is what I, I would probably say. People, hang on to your obies. Yeah. Um, speaking Cheers, of Margo. hanging on to stuff, we have fantastically been given, aren't we lucky, a submission this week for this segment. Yes, it's that time of the week where we're going to name that scene. I'm going to sound like one of those game show hosts soon. Um, no, thanks very much to Keith, who sent this one in. And I... FBL one. I like this one. Um, now, what you guys have to do in chat is you have to guess the name of the synth. And all we're going to do is we're just going to play you a video and it's going to have a bit of visuals and it's going to have audio, but use your ears mainly. Use a little bit of your eyes. Uh, the first person who gets it right in the chat um, gets bragging rights for a week. And, uh, you know, last week we had... So um, we are not going to say anything. We are just watching, Omar. No. We're watching. Type yep. your answer in, Henrik. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm typing in. I, I will let you know... <laughs> I'm sorry I said FBI. I one. will let you know <laughs> that the only person that knows the answer to this is me that's here. And in the chat room will be Keith because obviously that's his video. Other than that, it'll be up to you guys to work it out. So, without further ado, I reckon this one will go pretty quick, by the way. Here we go. How come we can't hear it? Here we go. Now, someone in the chat will know you. Someone will chat and know. Yeah, there's a couple of good suggestions. Yeah. Okay. I knew this one would go pretty quick. Right. Okay. Let's, let's see. Let's see. Here we go. <coughs> yes, it wasn't Emu. And it is the Proteus 2500. Yes, oh. that is correct. Well done. Yes. That's cheating. He covered that it up. Goes to, yeah, Native VS gets that one. Yes. Oh, very well done there. Robert. Ooh, Native VS was the yeah, first. Proteus. Yeah. I told yeah. you it would be pretty easy to guess that one. Um, but thank you very much, oh, Keith. That was a good, I thought it was, that was a good one. Yeah. yeah that was good. Brilliant. Interesting. Really, really enjoyed it. Now, he's he said he did this with his GoPro. So there you go, people. You can um, you don't need too too much fancy sort of um, a gear to film this. You could probably even just use your your cell phone or your mobile phone. They've got pretty good cameras on them these days. These Apple phones are pretty fancy, aren't they? Look at the bloody cameras on these things now, hey? Oh yeah. Soon they're going to be taking photos of Jupiter. Um, yes. Thanks very much, Keith. Beautiful. I don't know where he is. He's not. Um, what he would be watching. Anyway, that's okay. It, it was in the chat. Yeah, Keith, Keith was there. Maybe he's had to run off. Huh. You there, Keith? Where are you, mate? Come back. It's been a long show. It's going to be longer in a minute. When we go back to our mastering section, which is about to start in a couple of seconds. Um, yeah. If you do want to send in your name that synth, like Keith has and Eddie has and Darren has and um, Andrew hasn't. Um... <laughs> I may have one for you, actually, no, no. if we get a chance to do it. Sorry, I had to set you up there. Um, all you have to do is uh, send in the video. Um, you can send it to me via, like Keith did. He just sent it to me via Dropbox. Um, you can get to me that way. You can post it up on YouTube, make it an unlisted video or something like that. You can do a, a minute less or less. Um, make, make sure you try and hide it a bit more though. Like just make it hard for us. Like we don't want to give it away. I thought it was funny with the Beringer, Beringer stickers over Keith. So that was a nice little touch. Um, but yeah, beautiful. Ah, Keith is there. Beautiful. Good man. Very good. Very good. Right. We shall I get back. Hi, Keith. <laughs> we shall get back to our mastering show, guys, because now the biggest segment is coming up, um, is 
this one where we're going to talk about, if I get it right, hang on a sec, there we go. We're going to go back to Ian Shepherd, and he's going to tell us the steps of marketing. Over to you, Ian. Our viewers uh, are mostly sent geeks, and many of them do their mastering themselves or want to do it. So let's go into that subject. Can you go through the steps of mastering? Master, as I say, mastering for me is about making the music sound the best that it can be. And I think maybe the first thing to say is that I think there's real value in it being a separate process to mixing. Lots of people ask me whether you can use mastering process on the mix bus. Um, and of course, in a practical sense, that's that's perfectly possible. There's nothing to stop you bringing mastering plugins in on the stereo output of a mix and running them at the same time as you do the mix. But personally, I think that's a mistake. The way that I prefer to work is to mix as a, as a process and, and get the, the, the sounding the best that I possibly can and export that as a stereo file. And when it comes time for mastering, ideally, especially if it's something that I've been working on, I would leave some time um, you know, a week or two maybe between the two um, to, to kind of get some distance and get some perspective. And then I like to bring all of the songs into, I use WaveLab, but you can use any DAW for, for mastering processing at any rate. Um, and I line all of the songs up in a timeline. WaveLab lets you put them out all on the same track and then you can put individual processing on each clip. But even if you have a, a DAW that doesn't allow, I think most, lots of them do these days, but um, even if that's not possible with the DAW you're using, you can put each one on its own channel in the mixer. Um, and that allows you to have separate processing on each song. And that's really important. Um, there's, you know, lots of people kind of think that mastering is a, oh, you, you just put a limiter and a, and a level boost over all of the songs and, and you're done. And that misses out on the, the real benefit, which is to look at each song individually and say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to set the level and the EQ and the dynamics processing separately for each song. Um, so that's a really important part of the equation for me. The actual process is is very simple for me. First thing I do is lift the level up um, because I mentioned about the way that loudness affects the way that we hear things. If you if you start EQing and compressing something at a lower level and then decide to turn it up, you're probably going to have to change all of those settings that you just made because it's going to sound different to you because you've turned it up. Um, so first thing I do is bring the level up. I think, did you have a question? Yeah, about the level, um, I've always wondered why you have to deliver for mastering um, a mix which is... Uh, a certain amount of uh, dBs low, when when the mastering engineer can just lower it when he receives it. Why? Why? Uh, you you don't have to. Uh, no. Is is the simple answer. But I often suggest it, and lots of mastering engineers request it. I mean, I think historically, when I started out mastering, most of the masters came in on on digital audio tape, the uh, kind of small, kind of sort of. Um, they're almost like the video Dad. cartridges used to put in camcorders. Yeah. Um, and those would typically have, they'd have meters on them, but those meters were often analog meters rather than actually reflecting the digital signal. And so they weren't necessarily perfectly calibrated. So people were coming from this tradition of analog tape where you would allow the meters to push up into the red. And that's when you knew you were about right. And if you let the digital meters hit the red, then you're actually clipping. Yeah. So we would always encourage people to leave a few dBs of space back then. And I still encourage it these days because you're absolutely right. We, the mastering engineer can turn it down if they need to. But the, I mean, another thing to say is that a modern DAW can handle peak levels that go above zero because most all modern DAWs are use floating point processing. And the big advantage of floating point is that the levels can go above zero and they don't get clipped internally. So the, the only time you have to worry about the absolute peak level is at the output stage when you actually export it to a file. But there are also lots of plugins out there these days that emulate analog gear, you know, um, channels, SSL channel strips and tape emulations and emulations of valve or tube gear. 
And one of the things that they emulate often is the fact that if you push analog gear hard, it will distort. Um, and often it distorts in a pleasing way, so that's not necessarily a problem. But that gear was probably designed to be operated with the a kind of nominal level of about minus 18 RMS. Peaks can go higher, um, but the RMS level, or the VU level actually back then, which is the original way that they used to measure RMS level, um, would, would be around zero VU, which was about minus 18 on a digital meter. Now, if you push your signal up super high and then run it out to one of those plugins, you're actually operating it at a much higher level than the original analog gear was designed to be used at. Now, again, that's not necessarily a problem if you like the way that it sounds, but the risk is that all of these things get run flat out and nobody ever bothers to listen to them at a, a more realistic, real world level. Um, so my suggestion to people is to always leave a few dBs of peak headroom because it just reduces the risk of doing that. You know, everything can then be lower. Um, there's no risk of any clipping uh, and, you know, it's, it's fine. 24 bit audio, there's no need to get anywhere near zero at the mix stage. I mean, there's no need. You don't have to at the mastering stage either, except that that's the way that everybody does it. Um, but yeah, that that's. So it's not really a requirement, but I think it is a good rule of thumb, is the, yeah. the kind of answer to the question. So while while we are at at, at that subject, um, also compression and should a mix be compressed or should you leave that for the mastering engineer? Um, I don't know whether there's a should, but a mix certainly can be compressed. Um, I mean, when I was taught mastering the it's interesting because these days everybody's excited about analog gear and analog emulation um but when i got into the mastering profession the the coolest thing was to have ddd on your cd meaning it was digitally recorded digitally mixed and digitally mastered so so everything that i was using was digital and that was thought to be a good thing so even though i was using hardware it was effectively in the box because it never went back into the analog domain so that was the that was the way that I was trained. And that's still my kind of mindset, really, is that analog is a flavor that might be used in some cases rather than the standard way of doing it. Whereas there are lots and lots of other engineers who only use analog and all the time, and it's very much part of their way of working. So neither of those is right or wrong. In the same way, I wasn't taught to have a compressor on the mix bus, but many, many people are. So if you like mixing into a compressor, then that's what you should do. And that's how you should send it to the mastering engineer. Because if you are using heavy mix bus compression and you take it off, the mix will change dramatically. So the mastering engineer will be hearing something different than you've been working on. Um, occasionally, you will, I will get sent something where I feel that the, that compression has been overdone. So I might ask the client, oh, are you interested in trying a version that's been pushed a little less hard to see whether I can get even more out of it? But I would always like to hear both so that I can hear what they've been working on and make sure that I'm kind of sticking with their vision for it. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely fine to use compression when you're mixing if, if you like it and it gets you good results. Okay, good. And then let's back to let's get back to the mastering steps. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, leveling, that was where we were. Yeah. So the first stage is to get all of the levels consistent. So I will literally just work through the project and fairly quickly bring them up so that they are where I consider the, the sweet spot is the right kind of level. I have a limiter, a very clean digital limiter at the end of the chain, just to prevent clipping. Um, Quite often that means that the limiter is working too hard at that stage. Um, and that's just a clue to me that I'm probably going to need to use some other kind of dynamic control. But if I bring the level up and the song sounds fantastic, at that point I'm done. You know, at that point I wouldn't do any more. And that's another thing I like about doing the level first is that it encourages a minimalist approach. The best way to be invisible is to not do anything. Of course, you've done something because you've changed the level and that affects the way that we hear things. Yeah, that, that's that's stage one. Once the level is in the right place, 
and I take a quick tangent to say that obviously monitoring in a mastering studio is very, very important. So the acoustics and the monitoring need to be as accurate as possible. And one of the things that I do is I always have my monitoring at the same gain level at the amp, basically. So that means that as soon as I hear something, I can tell how loud or quietly it's been mastered because I've been listening to things at the same monitoring level since forever. I actually have two levels. I also have a dimmed level, which is 12 dB down, um, and I work with that as well quite a lot, but they're, they're very, very consistent. So I don't need to look at the meters too much. I just bring the song up till it sounds right to me at my mastering monitoring level. Um, and then I'm also going to hear it, and that, then I also can very quickly get an idea of whether the EQ is right or not. Um, I mean, when people are mastering things themselves, and on, I do a, a course called the Home Mastering Masterclass, where I, I teach people how to do this kind of stuff, um, and I do suggest that on that that people use reference tracks. So bringing in something that sounds fantastic to you everywhere else in the world, putting it in your DAW, I would recommend adjusting the loudness first. I mean, if you want to match the loudness, then that's fine. But there's a good chance it's been mastered super loud, and I don't really think that's necessary um, because of streaming, normalization, and all the rest of it. So probably bring the level down, and then you can use that as your reference track and compare it with the stuff that you're working on to see whether you're in the right ballpark. But for me, I don't often use reference tracks because I know in my head how things are meant to sound on my system. So then it's a question of balancing the EQ. The EQ changes the way that it sounds, so you might need to tweak the level again. Um, we've got a good idea of whether or not it needs extra dynamics processing. So whether it needs some gentle compression, whether it's hitting the limiter too hard, that kind of thing. So then I move on to the stage of optimizing the dynamics. Um, but before you do that, um... Do you think of, of imaging, um, I mean, the stereo image, um, uh, bass and such? Well, it's um, sometimes. <laughs> um, I tend to approach it, for me, it's like layers of an onion. You know, you have an onion and it's got a kind of really gnarly kind of outside so you peel that off and it looks smoother and nicer but might still have some imperfections so maybe you cut another couple of layers off and then it looks really good in comparison to what it did originally but there's still a few little blemishes for me it's the same with audio so stage one is bring the level up and then it's whatever hits me next and usually that's eq um because usually something will benefit you know it once you get it to the right level and start listening to it in comparison to the other songs, because I'm constantly flicking the nice, I've got all the songs laid out in the DAW so I can quickly skip from one song to another. So I'll listen to say lots of loud sections or lots of quiet sections and just see how they fit together and get an idea of the overall shape of the, the album or the EP or whatever it is as well. Um, and then, yeah, so usually the first thing I think is, Oh, actually that one is a bit bass heavy in comparison to that one. And this one, it's not quite bright enough or it it's too bright whatever that might be so usually the eq is the next thing that i do then i think there are kind of two degrees of of thinking about the stereo image i mean one thing i should say is that for me 90 percent of mastering is eq compression and limiting so i do fairly often adjust the stereo image but it's a much smaller factor usually than uh, the EQ and the dynamics. And so sometimes I'll just hear something and it's like, oh, okay, that's maybe the, the image is super wide. And I just think, okay, that I need to bring that in a little bit. Or it's really, really mono. And I think, oh, I'd really like some more space. So if that's the next thing that jumps out to me, I might do that and then do the dynamics processing. Or I think maybe more often than not, I would probably do the dynamics processing first. And then I'm listening to it and thinking, Oh, okay, now actually maybe it leads a little bit of gentle tweaking to the stereo image, or maybe it'll be work better if I adjust that. So it's, I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule about what I do next. I, I tend to do the stereo processing prior to the compression. Um, I like the EQ and the stereo image to be right hitting the compressor, because I think that's how you get to sound most invisible. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily always actually make the changes straight away, depending on, on what I hear. 
So your chain is not static. Uh, you can sometimes do something before something else. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's the I mean, the other thing to say is so at this point, we've got the whole process, right, which is level EQ and dynamics. Um, but at each stage, so listen to the level, how does that affect the EQ? Tweak the EQ. Does that mean I have to retweak the level a bit? Okay, now maybe I'm going to try some dynamics processing. Well, that might change. Maybe it holds back the loudest sections, or maybe it brings up the quieter sections. If it brings up the quieter sections, maybe the overall song now feels a little bit louder than it did. So I'll bring the loudness back again. And I make those adjustments prior to the compression, because for me, it's again, it's all about minimalism. So if I can get the level down going into the compressor, that will result in less compression. So And usually that's what I want. And so then I've affected the amount of compression by adjusting the level. So maybe that means I have to tweak the EQ. Um, so I tend to think of it as the ideal is that every time the changes are smaller. So you make big changes to start with and that at each stage you hone in on the final perfect result. Um, it doesn't always work that way when you're starting out. It takes some practice, but you basically just go round and round in circles. So level EQ compression, level EQ compression, level EQ compression. Actually, that's about right. Um, and at any point in there, I might say, oh, how about a bit of stereo image work? Or maybe, uh, oh, it needs a little bit of gentle saturation. Or um, maybe the, the contrast between the verse and the chorus, now that I've got the compression in place, needs a little bit more emphasis. So I might lose a little bit of subtle automation to just ease a section of the song back and then bring it back up for another end, perhaps. Um, so it's it's very much an in. And the other thing is that, you know, you do all of that for the first song and then you move on to the second song. And when you're doing it with the second song, you're doing it comparing back to the first song. So you might actually decide, oh, now I've heard the second song, I'm not quite happy with what I did with the first song. So I might go back to that and tweak that. And then you're onto the third song and it just, you know, and it gradually evolves. Um, so it's very much an interactive process and the, the order is never the same. It's never set in stone. It's, you know, the, the whole idea is to find the perfect settings for each piece of music and it's always different. When, when doing mastering, there are a lot of words like RMS and, and uh, loves. Can you explain that? I can try. <laughs> um, so I think I mentioned before. We will just pause that for a sec because uh, I think we will definitely want to be talking about that in a second. Let me just get that back to this. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that was a pretty big section that the steps of um, of mastering. And I thought um, we, you know, it was just before we go on to the, the RMF and LUFS section, he, get, he gets into a bit of uh, engineering talk in this one. So we'll, we'll see. Um, any questions or comments to be made here at this point? I thought that that section six was pretty, pretty valuable, uh, where he talked about this, that, he, that he uses the same loudness um, you know, on on the speakers and on the monitors. Um, so that means that doesn't matter what session he's mastering on, he knows how loud or how quiet the the mixing has been done. Uh, which I think is you know, sometimes we don't we don't obviously understand things are that obvious. You know, but that to me that's like ah oh, yeah of course duh, <laughs> that's a smart thing to do. Um, anyone else want to make a comment? I can't hear anyone talking. Uh, Darren uh, was muted. Oh, Darren. No, I was, I was just so saying, was I. I was busy oh. listening, yeah. Um, but it do, it's just showing you that you don't need, I don't know, thousands of plugins on the uh, mastering bus to, to make it, you know, all these different plugins you can get for mastering. There's like thousands of them. And then you see some um, mastering buses and it just look, it's just huge. Thinking, God, is that how, is that how you master? You need all that stuff. Mm. It turns out that you, you you don't necessarily need you know as little as possible. Um, I mean, I can't really say anything because I'm I can't I'm not a master, so mm. but yeah, I'm listening to it. It's really interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, what, just slightly digressing, we did talk about in chat that uh, guys in chat were talking about switched on park. I don't know why. 
Uh, and they wanted to see the cassette that I own. Uh, there it is there. And this is, a this is the one that I had when I was a child. Uh, and I don't know how old it is. It's probably a 70s or early 80s cassette. Um, you can actually tell because of the, you can even see the ripples in the, the paper. I don't know if that comes up on the camera. Yeah, you go there. You can see the ripples. See the ripples in the paper there? So it's getting pretty old. It still plays. Um, I don't think it's got Dolby. Um, it doesn't, I don't think I've read Dolby anywhere on here. Anyone can see it? Yeah. The sounds from CBS, hey? Um, I don't know if that sounds as good as vinyl. I doubt it. But anyway, interesting. Um, should we go on look, talk about LUFs? Shit, let's, LUFs and RMS. So this, this was actually quite interesting, this segment. Uh, when, when doing mastering, there are a lot of words like RMS and, and uh, LUFs. Can you explain that? <laughs> I can try. <laughs> um, so I think I mentioned before that, so when I was trained, um, I we measured loudness or we judged loudness using a VU meter, which is an old fashioned needle meter. Um, so, you know, it was all about the current running through a coil, made the needle move and it, that reading roughly corresponds to the RMS level. RMS is re root mean squared. So the output meters in a DAW show peak level and they respond basically you can imagine those those meters are sort of tracing up and down with the actual waveform you know they're very fast very detailed um they are unfortunately almost useless for assessing loudness um you know you can measure a change in loudness if you have one thing that peaks at minus three and another thing that peaks at minus nine then you know that if nothing else has changed there's a six db difference um but actually almost always there is something else that's different. It's probably hit a limiter or a compressor or whatever. So um, peak, yeah, it's, if you imagine uh, a snare hit versus a sustained pad sound, the snare hit has a massive transient at the beginning and then very quickly decays down to a tiny little thing, whereas the pad sound is going along like this all the time. If you turned the peaks of the, the pad sound up to match the, the peak level of the snare, that sound would be the same less level as the beginning of the snare the whole way through so it would sound much much louder than the snare would and anybody who's ever tried to record an actual snare or a, a gunshot for example will know that they they often sound really lame um, until you start processing them and compressing them and limiting them so root mean squared rms is basically an average of that peak level it's it's averaged over a 300 millisecond time window um, and it gives you something that corresponds more closely to what we hear as loudness. Um, so if you match the RMS level of two things, they're much more likely to sound of a similar loudness. Um, LUFS, which is the modern method of, of the internationally agreed standard method of measuring loudness. Um, so LU stands for loudness unit, full scale FS. Um, it's basically a, a variation of RMS, actually. Um, you basically add some filtering in to recognise the fact that our ears are much more sensitive in the, the broadly speaking, in the two kilohertz kind of region. So the upper mids, um, if you start turning up the upper mids on a signal, it will sound louder quicker than if you start boosting the bass or the very high treble. Um, so LUFS, try and take that into consideration. So it's a more useful version of RMS than RMS, basically. How, does that help? The, the other thing that is a bit more complicated about LUFS is that you will often hear that there are three different types talked about. So there's what is known as the momentary LUFS, which, like peak levels, measures very fast, very rapid changes in loudness. There is the short term LUFS, which is actually averaged over two or three seconds, uh, or in fact, three seconds, um, and varies more slowly, 
but I find more helpful for assessing the loudness of music. Um, and then there's the integrated loudness, integrated LUFS, which is an average over an entire piece of audio. So it could be over an entire song or over an entire album or an entire movie, whatever that is. <clears throat> and they're all useful for different things. Um, the integrated loudness is a helpful kind of summary of the loudness of a piece of music. So if something is at minus 9 LUFS as opposed to minus 16 LUFS, you know the one at minus 9 is probably louder. But it's it's a very crude measure. It's only a single number for an entire song or an entire album. So there could be a lot of variety in there. Um, if there is a lot of variety, then only certain moments of it will sound really loud and the rest of it will sound a bit quieter. Whereas if there's very little variety and it's very loud all the way through, that's going to give you a different impression. So I think something that people find confusing, I often people often say to me, well, I made all my songs minus 14 LUFS or whatever the, the number is, but they still sound a different loudness. Um, and my answer to that is, well, that's because we don't expect everything to be equal loudness. Um, if you have, if, if it's an indie rock album and you have an acoustic ballad and a, an aggressive guitar song, you expect the acoustic ballad to be quieter than the aggressive guitar song. So if you master both of those to minus 14, the acoustic ballad is going to sound too loud. Or in comparison, the, the aggressive guitar song is going to sound too quiet in comparison to the acoustic ballad. So it's not that there's a problem with LUFS. I mean, LUFS is not perfect. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty good, I have to say. Works for 80 to 90% of material really well. Um, but you need to understand how to use it. And one of the first things to understand is it's not intended as a goal or a target, not the integrated LUFS because of this variety and the differences in genres um, and uh, arrangements and, and all the rest of it. What I find more valuable in mastering is to use the short term LUFS. And the approach that I recommend people use is to balance or match the balance, not match, the loudest sections of a song. Um, so if you have <clears throat> a song that is loud all the way through and a song that's basically quiet and has a loud ending, if you match the loud ending with the song that's loud all the way through and then balance the quieter sections of the song that starts off quiet musically with that, then it's going to work. They will have completely different integrated values. The one that's mostly quiet will have a much lower value because most of the song is quiet, but they will yeah. feel well. musically correct next to each other. Um, and that is a very effective strategy for... So when people come to me and, you know, I, I, people keep asking, how loud should I master for CD or for streaming or whatever? And I say, you, that's the wrong question. You know, if I gave you an integrated val loudness value, it will be wrong. But yeah. if you take the loudest sections and make them consistent, and you can make those loudest se sections as loud as you like, depending on what your opinion of the loudness war is, um, and then balance everything else musically, everything will fall into place. Yeah, that that, that will work uh, with the raising levels on the on the quiet sections. Um, but if it's classical, where where what do you do then? Um, I usually um, use the integrated loudness, but I measure it on on a short um, period of the loud material. Um, well, I mean, um, if you have if you have um, if you measure the short term loudness of something and it's fairly consistent. So I mentioned that when I'm mastering, I like to skip between the loud sections of various songs. If you do that, you'll find that the short term loudness and the integrated loudness are very similar, right? Because mm -hmm. If you only measure a, sh a short section of music, the short term loudness and the integrated, the average loudness of that section will be very similar. Um, so you're effectively doing the same thing there. Um, I mean, I have to say mastering classical is harder. It's, it's much more challenging um, in terms of, of getting the loudness right. Um, yeah, because but you don't use compression there either. Not much, at least. I, no, it's very rare that I might use some very gentle limiting, um, depending on what the material is. But no, I tend to just use automation. But I mean, if if I can, if I can just let it run <clears throat> without any dynamic processing at all, then that's probably the best. But 
there are there's a lot of classical music where actually the natural dynamic range is too much for a domestic listening situation so i remember when i was <clears throat> uh young um i was a big fan of simon rattle who is now the uh, conductor of the uh, berlin phil i think as well as many other um orchestras uh, but at the time he was conducting the city of birmingham symphony orchestra here in the uk and i had two recordings by him one was of Mahler's second symphony and one was of the dream of gerontius by elgar the Mahler recording had been mastered impeccably so the quiet sections sounded beautifully quiet and the fortissimo sections were absolutely earth shattering um but even so the dynamic range had been reduced tastefully from the natural sound of it it's not like they just put the mics up and let it go there was still recording and mixing technique being used in that to achieve that result the Elgar recording was also very good um, and, and also had you know technique being used but for me it wasn't as successful because what I found was if you turned up the quiet section so that you could hear the singers clearly and they sounded full and oh excuse me and they sounded uh, full and um, natural when you got to the loud sections it was too loud it was uncomfortable you were worried that the speakers weren't going to be able to handle it and if you turned that down so that the loud sections sounded big and impressive and full when it got back to the really quiet sections again suddenly everything sounded too small and too distant so if i had been mastering that then i would have used automation effective like riding the fader back in the days of analog to bring up the quieter sections and get that balance right and the great thing about automation is you can do it with great precision so you can choose where the changes are going to happen and make sure that they are invisible um, as i said but it's a different strategy than you know using a multi-band compressor on a, a rock or an edm track we'll keep going with true this. peak uh, what is that <laughs> it's, so well, it's another so, so the the loudness units the lufs is defined by um a standard called r128 um and un, and that includes the description of short-term um integrated and momentary loudness and it also defines true peak level so there's a kind of a complete package of measuring loudness in audio so true peak is like the true the peak signal that we talked about the one that i said that's not really useful for measuring loudness um, the one thing that it is useful for is to tell you whether or not you're clipping. And again, I mentioned before, you know, clipping. And sometimes people use clipping distortion as a, as a creative effect. Um, but that for me, that's not something you should be doing at the mastering stage. Um, if it happens, it should be inaudible. And the problem with it is that it very quickly becomes quite audible and it inflicts a lot of damage on the audio signal. And it's not very musical damage you know if you slam an analog tape there's some distortion there but it's it's kind of quite nice quite musical sounding distortion it can be and the same in my experience is not true of digital clipping so the true peak level is just a refinement again like as lufs is an improvement on our rms true peak is a an improvement on the digital peak or the, the sample peak meters that we used to have um, it's basically oversampled so it's basically um, running at a higher sample rate so that it can spot cases where the the reconstructed waveform so when it's converted from digital back to analog for playback the peak levels might actually go above zero and that can happen when the musical signal has been quite heavily limited and the loudness is high if you're pushing up against zero sample peak um, zero db fs all the time it's hard to describe without a picture but if you imagine that the, the, if, the, if the waveform is doing this when it gets reconstructed it actually does this and it actually overshoots that zero point um, and that can be an issue for a lot of especially consumer gear especially you know the um, converters that you get in mobile phones and uh, portable devices especially or, or consumer electronics where they don't have enough analog headroom to accommodate that overshoot so the true peak level predicts when you might have um, 
peak levels that go above zero and cause extra distortion further down the processing chain. So that could be at a digital to analog converter. More likely these days, it's probably when a an MP3 file or another lossy data compressed format gets decoded. So when something is uh, converted for playback on YouTube or Spotify or wherever, you know, I'm sure everybody knows that they're using data compressed codecs which throw away 90% of the data. Um, still sounds remarkably like the original audio signal, but the that process is, is actually pretty brutal in terms of what it does. You know, it slices the audio up into very narrow bands and it assesses the audibility of each band. It throws away the ones that it thinks you can't hear, keeps the others, then rebuilds it. And I mean, if anybody who's done any kind of complex filtering on audio knows that it will change the peak level, it messes with the phase, all the rest of it. Um, so the chances of that reconstructed waveform being the same as the one that went in are very low. They can sound very similar, but there are often peaks that go up beyond the original maximum peak, which if it's zero DBFS means that they could go above that level. So again, if you have a file that you're measuring and the loudness meter tells you that the true peak level is plus two, that means when you play it back on a digital to audio to analog converter, the peak levels might go above zero, but more likely if you encode it to MP3, the MP3 can encode the peaks that go above zero, but when you decode it, those peaks are likely to get clipped off um, and cause extra distortion. So m that's a really complicated answer, but luckily the advice that I can give you is fairly simple. If you're not mastering at extreme loudness, my suggestion is to keep the peaks at minus one true peak. Well, there you go. So, <laughs> um, true peak, and you know, where do we want to go with that? The next section is uh, just letting us know is, is mastering with speakers and headphones. So, this one coming up is going to be pretty interesting. But just while we've got it, we should always include chatties and see if they've got um, anything to contribute here. Uh, Ken reckons that he loves this audio file discussion. Nice. Um, a lot of, there were a lot of comments earlier about the um, when Ian was talking about the classical music and how there's this natural dynamics. Uh, the term he used was natural dynamics, and I guess that's very subjective, isn't it? Um, the term natural dynamics, because if you ever go to a live uh, concert with classical instruments, it would never ever sound anything like that on, in a recording because the speakers and the acoustics of your room and everything like that, it's just not going to be able to reproduce that dynamics, is it? So it must be an absolute nightmare trying to, to record this stuff um, and record it well so that it can reproduce some of its, you know, some of its charm. Um, and he and Ian did do the Philharmonic Orchestra too, I believe, in, as part of his, um, his resume. So he's, he's got experience down that. Um, you guys want to make a comment before um, we go on to the next? Yeah. Yeah, I, I asked the question about classical because I compared it to uh, ambient. Um, lots of people are doing ambient, especially with modeler. Mm. And um, it's important to know how to master that too. So that's that's why I mentioned it. Yeah, no, that's true. Ambient, ambient's a good um, a good one because um, with ambient music, you really want to have dynamics in your recording, don't you? That that's actually the whole purpose of ambient type of music is that you've got the light and the shade and the builds and the drops and yeah, so it's kind of classical in in that sense, isn't it? Um, you guys want to move on to the headphones section? This is pretty interesting. Yep. All right, let's do it. Some people say you shouldn't master or shouldn't mix on, on headphones and others says you should. Um, some says both. What do you say? I say whatever works for you. Um, you know, there are, there are pros and cons for each. For me personally, I prefer to work on speakers. 
um, you get that physical interaction with the sound. Um, you get to hear how it interacts with the room. Um, and I've put a lot of time and effort into getting the monitoring in my studio, you know, as, as accurate as possible. So I know that I can rely on it. Um, but that did take a lot of time and experimentation and it requires some acoustic treatment. And I'm lucky that my um, little room here is not near anybody um, who is going to be upset by the sound that comes out because the, the room is not soundproofed. It's, it's acoustically treated, so it sounds good, but it, it, quite a lot of that sound goes out into the outside world. Um, so that's a challenge that can be difficult to do. And there is no such thing as a perfect room. Even an acoustically designed, the best studios in the world have uh, peaks and nulls in the frequency response. They have a sweet spot where everything sounds great and they have other areas where things don't sound as good. Um, you know, it varies from room to room, but the advantage of headphones is that you have no room. The speakers are right on your ears, so you only have to rely on the accuracy of the headphones in terms of the, the sound that you get. So, uh, I mean, for example, I have a pair of Sennheiser HD 650s. They're expensive, but they're not ridiculously expensive. And they're very, very good. They have a reasonably flat frequency response. I think the most important thing about them is that they are very, very low distortion in comparison to most headphones. Lots of headphones are, have a ton of distortion in there. And if the if the headphones are distorting, then you it's difficult to know what's the headphones and what's the music. So it's possible to miss details in what you're working on. And that's very important at the mastering stage. Um, you can use something like Sonarworks to, if you have a custom profile for the, so it's actually measured for the, the actual pair of headphones that you're using. Um, if you buy a pair or send them off to Sonarworks to get them measured, that can be really helpful. They have a, a generic setting, sort of an average setting, and I've found that's less successful. Um, but with those, the frequency response gets to be very, very accurate. So, and I mean, for example, I interviewed Glenn Schick on the podcast, on the mastering show. Um, he is a, a pro mastering studio. I mean, he, a pro mastering engineer. He used to own a multi-room facility and he now masters on headphones from a laptop. Uh, very often, or sometimes, next to a beach, uh, he told me, which sounds pretty appealing to me. Um, I think, you know, I, I mentioned I spent 10, 15 years being trained and, and learning my craft at a professional mastering studio and I was working on speakers all that time. That's still my preference. Maybe if I had been trained working on headphones, I would prefer working on headphones. I mean, he moved from headphone uh, speakers to headphones, so it's, it's certainly possible. Um, I think it wants to be a really expensive pair of headphones. Uh, you know, I think, I'm not sure which models Glenn is using now, but he was, at one point he was using Audacy, where you're talking thousands of dollars for a pair of headphones, which is a lot of money. Um, and I think the other thing you need to be careful with, with headphones, for me, when I, well, when I did the, the videos for the Home Mastering Masterclass course, I was using that the HD 650s and I noticed I had a tendency to turn them up very loud because I wasn't getting that feedback in the room. I was almost looking for it on my head um, and I would take them off and, and realize that I had been monitoring much louder on headphones than I would on speakers. I think there's a genuine risk there that you might end up damaging your hearing um, working on headphones. So it would require a great, great deal of restraint. Um, and I think also you have to kind of have an intuition in that case for how it's going to sound in the room. If you've got it pumping out of speakers, you know that the bass is hitting you in the chest. You can, to a certain extent, you can feel the sound. You don't get that in the same way with headphones. So you have to kind of, it's a different mindset. You have to tune into it differently. Um, but you know, you do have the advantage that your studio is in your, in your hand basically, or in a, in a case that you carry around with you. So, you know, I, I mean, that's what I do. If I if I go to a, an unfamiliar studio, I take the Sennheisers because then I can put them on and I know exactly that's a kind of a benchmark for me. Oh, OK, that's how they sound. How does it sound on the speakers? It's an extra data point, which is very useful. Yeah, 
so so it's actually important to to work with the same phones for for years uh, to learn them um i think that's an important part of yeah. of mastering in general is yeah. in, you, you know you need to know the mastering it's not necessary to have the perfect room or perfect monitoring i mean the better the room and the better monitoring or the better the headphones the easier it gets you know the reason that professional mastering engineers have spent tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds on their equipment and their room is because it makes their life easier you know they can work faster and more reliably but the most important thing is a lot of time i mean one suggestion that i give to people is to just make sure you listen to lots and lots of music in your mix or mastering room you know lots of us will put a load of time and effort into a special place that we can make and work on our music and then you so you go there and you listen to your your own music and then you go somewhere else to listen to everybody else's music um, you need to take everybody else's music into your mixing or mastering room and have it playing there so that you can learn how it sounds on your system because if you that way your ears will tune in and you're kind of go, oh that's what that should sound like and then your instincts will make you move your own music in the right direction and you don't have to it's not like you have to sit there kind of going listening really intently um i you know put it on when you're serving the internet or writing a letter or soldering cables or you know um fixing patch cables whatever it is just have that music playing all the time and subconsciously you'll pick up the way that it's meant to sound all right we've got to that section um probably we, we're just being sort of cautious of time we probably have got a, at least another maybe 30 minutes left of uh of this interview and i don't know if we really have got the time to be streaming that um tonight but what we can do is um we'll make the rest of that that interview available for you guys to check out obviously for free on on youtube it'll be on both um henrik's and my uh, youtube channels um so we'll make that available for you guys uh we'll post those up within the next day or so you guys can keep an eye on that um, but before we do finish up with uh, Ian, I think we should probably talk about his plugins. Um, now I need to find out where that was. Henrik, can you can you just uh, have it? Do you remember much about his plugins? I know there was a link somewhere, wasn't there, that you gave me? I probably should get that. Yeah, up. That, there's um, the page called Loudness Penalty. Um, it's meter it's... plugins, isn't it? Meter plugins? Yeah, meter plugins is where the, the, the plugins are, and and one oh. of the plugins is also available in a, in a web version um, where you can check your levels, how they, or check your song, how it will sound on the different streaming services. Yeah. Um, and you can see if they will turn it down or up or whatever they will do with it. So it's a good reference um, if you if you are not sure if it will sound right. I don't use it much. I did in the beginning. Uh, Ian doesn't use it e either um, because he knows how it will sound. Um, but, but, but it's really a good help if you need to get into mastering and understand it. So these meter, these meter plugs, are these all his? Uh, yes, it's not him who program it, um, but okay. but but uh, he he's part of uh, de develop de developing them. Um, so Dynameter, for example, is a plugin which uh, which shows um, over time how your loudness is. Uh, so so you can look back and you can yeah yeah. You have to check the page actually to to see what it does. It's it's some really good tools for for doing and learning mastering. Hmm. Um, I, I I recommend most of them. I I don't have perception. Perception is good if you want to put it on more than one track uh, to compare things. Uh, um. um that's one of the plugins, um, but loudness meter and and um, loudness penalty mm -hmm. are, are the important ones. Thank you to David for the four ninety nine. Uh, great masterclass. Yeah, 
are in, in obviously very, very knowledgeable. Uh, and, you know, we are mere grasshoppers uh, compared to what he, he knows about. Um, but, I mean, like, if you put all those little bits of, of information together, I think that will set you on a pretty solid start. I mean, he's given us some really, really good good bits of information, like, you know, learning, learning about laughs, learning about, you know, the sausage, uh, too much compression, um, listening to all your tracks. Uh, so, you know, Darren, you've just done an album. When you're listening to all your tracks and in a mastering point of view, you'll find that when you've actually mixed individual tracks, you'll find they will be different dynamics. And then when you're actually putting an album together, they all have to kind of work with each other as an album. So he he talks about going back and making fine adjustments after he's even finished mastering a track. He'll go to the second track and then he'll go back to the first after he's done the second and make some more finer adjustments to get to get sort of a consistency across the whole album. Um, some some really really interesting things that he was talking about. That's for sure. Any questions? And, and you, you can say it's not important because all the streaming sites are, are making it sound equal. But but if you upload to Bandcamp or, or any other sites where people can download your songs, it's important they have the same loudness on for a whole album. Mm. Um, so, so mastering is important, uh, even mm. though the streaming services... Uh, compensate for it yeah and you get this kind of thing like we go mentioned the sausage waveforms are fatiguing to listen to you get this kind of thing where you listen if you listen to stuff now on the radio uh, and you know what you're listening for you can hear when they have quiet parts in a track and then it goes to a loud part or vice versa you'll hear the compression kick in and there'll be elements that have that tailed into the, the loud or the quiet part and those and those elements will pump up or or drop down in, vol in volume, and it just sounds so bad if you know what you're listening to. And that's where people have left compression on parts of the, you know, of the mix when they really probably shouldn't have. Um, it's just yeah. Or maybe they've they've put a compressor on the master, which he was saying probably not a good idea to do um, as an overall sort of rule of thumb, wasn't he, Henry? Um, big thank yeah. yous to, just quickly before you answer that, Henry, big thank yous to everyone who's been popping some kind donations for the beer fund, uh, Synthetic for the $5. Thanks, Ramsey, or an all-important stuff to cover. Nice interview, Henry, well done, JX3D. Inverted Pope's £10, wow, very generous of you. Beer, wine, tokens for everyone. Enjoy, really enjoying the stream, but again, I enjoy all of them. Very, very nice of you to say. Thank you very much. And Wigoo's just popped it in. With the five pounder saying, keep it up, and the chicken dancing. Can't see the chicken dancing on online, I don't know why. Um, but anyway, that's uh, part of, God knows what it is. Um, yeah, so what were we saying? Yeah, the, the sausage fest. Um, we were saying about the sausage fest. Why is that not working? There we go, it's working now. Um, uh, you, you had a question on the me. master. You have yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you have to repeat it in a second because um, I have to say something else now that we see inverted popes on the stream. Yes. Um, in the chat. Um, he's using Bitwig as we talked about in the beginning. And, yes. And um, it would be nice if he would join the stream one day so we could. Yeah, we have to do it in the new year. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll talk. To, um, I talked to Chob offline about it. We'll, we'll see if we can get him in the new year. We've only got one more show left for the year and that's next week. And then I'm off for two weeks. Um, and then we can, New Year's probably be the first show. And then after that, we can see what we can program in. Um, thank you to Manny for the 499. Big, big appreciation there. Awesome guys. Um, yeah. So the question uh, to you, Henrik, was um, about putting a compression uh, on the master mix. Or the master output. Whether yeah, it was a good yeah. idea. Um, um, only if it works as a limiter. Um, and uh, if 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 you hear a bass suddenly being pushed down because there are drums or strings on, 
then it's too much. Mm. So, so limit as little as possible. Um, it, 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 it should not be a sound in your, in your final master. It should be something you don't hear. Mm. That's, that's a goal. Yeah. Now, speaking of headphones, um, we were talking about different types of headphones. The guys in the chat were saying uh, AKGs and Sennheisers and all sorts of all these different brand names have been throwing, thrown around. Now, obviously, um, there's some really expensive headphones out there, like um, he was talking about a £1,000 headphone. Um, I remember we were talking in Discord um, a few few months ago about headphones, and actually it might have even been a year or so ago. I was actually talking about them before I ended up getting the Bayard Dynamics that I've got. Um, I've got the 990s. Uh, now, when we're talking about Discord, I should remind everybody that there is a Discord server, and there is the link there. Really easy one to remember, bit.ly forward slash Ramsey Discord. It'll take you straight there. It's free to join, there's no scams involved, and we just continue the chat during the week if you so like to. Um, yeah, so I've noticed quite a few of us have got the Bayer Dynamics now, and the headphones that I used to have before, so you've got them as well, are yours the 770s or the 990s? No, the Bayer Dynamics, the ones on your head. You're muted. You've muted yourself. You're muted yourself. That, that's that's the 990s. I don't like the 770s. Yeah, um, me either. Uh, but but they are not good for mixing and mastering. Um, no. um, these are, are better. They they are they are very neutral. Um, they are the 50s. Yeah, the um, 80s, 80, 80 yeah. HM 50s, yeah. whatever they're called. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where am I? Um, Somewhere. Uh, they're cheap and neutral. Um, they're not perfect, but but they are very good for the price. Yeah. Um, but all, also, also switch to other headphones, switch to speakers, listen to listen on all you can. Uh, yes, and um, and and learn how it sounds. Um, so one day you can use only headphones if you understand how it will sound later on your speakers. Mm. Yeah. So learn, learn, and get used to how your gear is working. I think we should do a mixing show. Um, and this is going to be really hard to do because mix, there's so many different types of mixers out there and it, and it does actually make a difference what type of mixer you've got. But when we talk about mixing, we're going to be talking about it from the point of view of getting your tracks and all your mix sounding right, not necessarily the mixers themselves. So what we're talking about does tend to get to the mixing sort of side of things, not so much the mastering side. And I think using things like playing your music in the car, playing your music on uh, on your phone, on your AirPods or whatever you've got, uh, some sort of Bluetooth head, headset, um, and playing them through your standard monitors that you've got in your studio and your, and your standard monitoring headphones, I would be doing all of that in your mixing process, not in your mastering process, in your mixing process, because by the time you've done that, you will got quite a long way to getting it sounding as good as you can before it then needs to go to someone like Ian to actually do the final, you know, the final beautiful touches to it. Um, That's why it's been hell for me. Why is that, mate? Because I've uh, my, well, my speakers blew, as you know, Rave Dave killed my speakers, so I had no speakers. My decent headphones I haven't got anymore, so I'm working on really couple <laughs> ones. And three weeks ago, my car stereo's gone uh, pants, oh, as Andy geez. would use. Uh, so I can't even listen to stuff in the car. So basically, <laughs> I've only been able to listen to mix, master on some really crappy headphones that I've been really struggling. Mm. But, but that's a good thing too, because if you can make it sound good on crappy headphones, then you are, you're going <laughs> a long way. And your, and your album well, sounded pretty true. good, mate. Yeah, sounded pretty good. The only problem <laughs> is I can't listen to that back in the car to see whether it's all right. I mean, that's why yeah. that uh, track nine was such a was such a. It took me, like I say, three weeks to get that right because I, I had nothing to listen to it, and it was just it was just a nightmare. So, mm. but yeah, I understand that, mm. and like I say, yeah. but but, but uh, try to learn what you can what you can hear, what you can hear too much of, and what you cannot hear enough of 
on your headphones. Mm. When you learn those limits, then you know what to compensate for. And also our ears are different too. I, one of the things I've noticed with me personally um, is I tend to, on a headphone, I tend to have too much drum and probably too much bass. And then when I listen to it in, in a car or on a different sort of stereo system, I find that they're too too much in your face, those, those particular, yeah. like a kick drum and a bass. So I'll then go back and then I'll wind it back and it, it'll sound quieter on my headphones, but I'll know you have to trust it because... Gener generically, they sound better if it still sounds okay on your headphones, not as great, but if it sounds better on the other things like car stereos and hi-fi systems and that, that, that tends to be the, the one that I fall for all the time. And I always do it because it sounds great on your headphones and <laughs> you go check it out and it's way too loud in your car. Oh, also, I, I did have a punctured eardrum many years ago, which is uh, on my left side, which has uh, altered the frequencies on that left hand side, believe it or not. So I wonder if your, your mix is it's healed. slightly to the right or <laughs> slightly to the left. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, have a, uh, I have a dip in my, my hearing too. It's, it's something I, is it called inherited? Um, it's something from my family, um, um, which my dad has too. Um, and uh, I have to compensate for that too. That's just a, a s small area. Uh, I can't hear, um, so I have to watch it visually and listen on different speakers. Uh, on some, on some, some speakers, uh, I suddenly hear a, a peak of frequencies I, I don't hear usually. Mm. Um, so it's good to listen on both crappy speakers and good speakers because some of them um, reveals uh, the things you can't hear. Um, mm. yeah. I need to mention one more thing about headphones because it seems to be a popular thing right now, guys in chat. These are sealed, um, you know, they're a sealed back, and these are not a sealed back, so the biodynamics have got the, the grill in them. And the difference, if you don't know this, uh, and this is something to, to actually do know and understand, the difference is, is that the bass acoustic of your speaker drivers in here um, aren't going to get as much air coming from behind. They're only going to be able to push air into your ear. So there's a different base or there's, there's a different, you know, driver response that you get out of sealed units than you do out of the ones that have got the, the open backs. So um, having said that, I, I would have to say these kind of sound, Semi. these kind of sound bassier, but these, these sound more, there's probably more clarity in the bass in Imagine. these, less muddy. Well, yeah, you've got open back, yeah, but, closed but back, both, you've also got yeah. the semi, semi amp, yeah. Yeah, you've got semis but and both, full. Both of those headphones um, doesn't reveal the subs, so yeah. if you later play the mix on, on, on speakers, you hear, oh, that's yeah. all too much sub. So, yeah. Speaking of speakers, we, be aware we of that. There's, there's a whole show on what monitors to get. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we talk uh, about monitors and we talk about the cheaper ones like the, the, oh, yes. the YAMs, the HS series and the, the KRKs and, you know, and really, you know, where we, we, if you want to go down the proper route of monitors, they're, you know, a lot of money, lots and lots and lots of money. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I will recommend get some okay speakers, some good speakers, and then get a Sonoworks reference for or the new version. I can't remember what it's called. I'm still on the reference for. Um, then you can adjust the speakers so they sound fine in your room. Um, mm. And then you can trust them. I, so I, I agree. It doesn't but matter I, what speaker. I agree, but I think... A set of music monitors, a proper, you know, professional grade music monitors are a must, especially if you're doing something you know, like a commercial release album and things like that. But at the same time, I would also recommend having a normal hi-fi system. And I don't mean like a, a boom box that you carry down to the beach with you. I'm, I'm talking about a proper hi-fi system with, you know, proper wooden enclosure speakers. They um, won't be 
the same acoustic response as your studio monitors will be. But when you listen to your stuff, do it in a different room in, where the hi-fi is, if you can, and then you'll, you'll hear different in your mix. And then you'll have to adjust your mix based on those subtle differences. Don't, they're not gonna be massive adjustments. You're not gonna be making massive EQ changes on and loudness changes on each of your, each of your tracks. But um, keep, keep those adjustments subtle because if you adjust something too much because you've reacted Oh my God, like the bass was too high or uh, there was too much rumble in the low end. So I'm going to take all the bottom end of that out. I'm going to EQ right up to hundred Hertz, you know, like that sort of stuff. You've got to be very, very careful being too aggressive with your EQ. Um, so always, always rule on the sort of, when I do my mixing, I'm always sort of ruling on, I come back. I'm always coming back to the point of where it was as opposed to going and, and being subtractive with it. So yeah. 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 Also, if you remove something, then something else needs to be lower too, perhaps. So, so do, do, do small adjustments, not big. Yeah. Big, it always causes trouble. Cause you'll find with speakers, they, they, they amplify the whole, the whole thing about a speaker is it vibrates sound and it amplifies what's coming out. So what you're hearing, is an amplified aspect of something and you're hearing your brain's processing it as being, oh my God, that sounds so much different to the studio monitors. I need to go back and change it. So you then compute in your brain, oh, I need to make a big change because that was a big difference that I heard. But in reality, it's actually a small difference at the, the EQ level because that's pre-amplification. Do you know what I mean? So that, that's why we should always be softly, softly with those changes. Let's go to Chatty's quickly before we wrap up the show. Um, it's just after midnight here, so I've, I need to sort of wrap it up pretty quick. Uh, people are talking about their monitors and stuff, which is awesome. Wow, lucky to have Adams. They're nice. Very, very lucky to have them. Yes. Beautiful. Wow, guys, I think we've, um, we've done good. We promised we'd do a mastering show and it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for Henrik. So big, big congratulations to Henrik on, on all that as well done, mate. Um, excellent interview. And I said before, we'll, we'll show you the rest of that interview uh, on both his and my channel during the week. Um, give us a chance to post it in the next couple of days and that will be up. Yes, I'm gonna be turning into a pumpkin any second now as Wagu <laughs> said. <laughs> Um, don't forget to um, give Darren some love. He's just uh, he's he's got all the merch, you know. He's out. His album's out. He's excited. We're oh, he excited. He, unlike Andy, he's still got. Excited. I've been listening to it that many times. I've got better for it. <laughs> he's still got his pants on, unlike Andy. But um, he's he's doing well. And um, make sure you go to uh, Bandcamp. Um, link is going to be in the description of the video if you haven't got it. But it's Darren T House. Tomorrow, tomorrow will be. A Tomorrow there'll be a video out um, with track number three on Paradise uh, saying about the album being out. So you can listen to that as well if you want. Yep. Beautiful. Subscribe to Darren's channel. Links in the description below. Andy, um, you're going to be busy uh, this week fixing up all your old CD stuff and um, maybe you might Hopefully. do it. Maybe you get a video yeah. done. Who knows? Chat to us well, during the week we if you need. Live in joyful hope. Well, I'll try and get that done. If, if I find the power supply for that stupid box, I'll, I'll do it. But, um, yeah, hopefully those tracks will be up on Bandcamp next week. I mean, oddly enough, interest in listening to this mastering stuff, uh, I might actually take a totally different approach because I was just basically tidying them up in audacity, and, and I'm not sure. I might actually try a, something different, a little some little nuggets of information in there that I just thought, ooh, mm. I think I might have to try that. Um I mean, I can't remember how these things were mixed way back in the day. I mean, whether there was compression on them through the mix bus or, or there probably was my old Alasis compressor slapped across stuff because that's what we did. Um, mm. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm intrigued just to have a little play about. I mean, my problem is when you, when you try to do various little bits, um, like put a compressor on the mix through audacity and is it oh it's, i've got no idea whether i'm doing anything good or it just sounds so i never bother i just just use it for topping and tailing and tidying and a bit of eq but 
anyway so some some food for thought and i'll try and get on yes inverted popes yes i'll yes you can drum your fingers as much as you like but keep nagging it's good to be nagged <laughs> <laughs> all right um and once again big thank you to henrik um hopefully you get better mate because it's yeah, no indeed. good being thank cruel. you henrik mm. much appreciated on that note goodbye and see you next week toodaloo yep see you later Ta folks Bye -bye. take care everyone yeah